and liftoff, liftoff of the 25th Space Shuttle mission, and it has cleared the tower. Pieces of ice tumble off as the coldest space shuttle launch ever gets underway. Challenger seems to shake herself free of the ice and goes. All five rocket engines burning well. The first teacher, Krista McAuliffe, on her way to space with six other astronauts on board. We'll be hearing shortly from John Lawrence in Houston. into a beautiful blue sky, crystal clear weather here in Florida, although it's very cold. Everything going well. Velocity 2,257 feet per second. Now One minute 4. in. 3 nautical miles, downrange distance 3 nautical miles. And across from me, hundreds of school kids jumping up and down and cheering as this space shuttle takes off with teacher Krista McAuliffe on board. No withdrawal up. And that means the engines are running well. Two and a half minutes into the flight, the solid rocket boosters will drop away, and we should be able to see it. What's happened? What happened? Still going. Vic, did something strange happen then? Something is gone amiss. Something is wrong. We have a problem. Nothing from mission control, but I could see pieces of something falling off the side as if one of the solid rocket boosters had come away early, Bob. It's still climbing. The shuttle is still climbing, but there is a problem. There appears to be a serious problem. What's happening? Not a word from mission control. Everybody here is open mouth. The controller is here looking very carefully at the situation. Where is the shuttle, Vic? Can Not you see it? Major malfunction. Now, direct from CBS News. This Radio Net Alert Bulletin. This is Christopher Glenn at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. There is a major problem which developed just a few seconds into the flight. We could see it happen. There seemed to be some kind uh, of, a, uh, of, a, of an explosion aboard the rocket. And all of a sudden, all communication with the spacecraft was lost. Obviously, it is going nowhere at this point. It looks as if... Debris is falling out of the sky. It almost appeared as if one of the uh, solid rocket boosters or one of the spacecraft main engines went awry and something happened. Flight director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. Oh, a great tragedy here. Krista McAuliffe, the first private citizen in space, and the rocket has apparently exploded in the first in minutes effect. of flight. We're trying to get some information by listening to Mission Control. We will report uh, more as we have information available. Again, to repeat, uh, we have a report uh, relayed to through oh. the flight dynamics officer. A terrible the vehicle thing. has exploded. We are now looking at uh, all the contingency operations and awaiting uh, word from any recovery of forces in the downrange field. A terrible thing. Debris falling out of the sky, falling slowly, painfully, tragically slowly toward the Atlantic Ocean just a few miles offshore. This flight, which was to have been such a bright chapter in the history of the manned spaceflight program, turning in a flash of an instant into terrible, terrible tragedy. Of course, um, mission control only giving very scanty information as they uh, scramble to try to find out what happened and to determine exactly what the status is. But as you heard them say, apparently the shuttle Challenger exploded within the first minute or so of flight and uh, the fate of the crew members is, is unknown, but it does not look good at all. The smoke, just um, crazy patterns in the sky, contrails from bits of debris going, uh, going down toward the ocean, still falling. People in the grandstands, uh, fans who had come to for many miles from all over the country to wish Krista McAuliffe well, sitting stunned, uh, some of them leaving and shaking their heads in disbelief. We can see them from where we sit. 
an this awful is Mission Control Houston. We have no additional word at this time. A terrible sight and one certainly that I had hoped that I would never have to see. So NASA looking at its contingencies at this point, but really it, it looks absolutely awful. Looks like there is no hope for any of the people aboard that shuttle. Reports from the flight dynamics officer indicate that the vehicle uh, uh, apparently exploded and that uh, impact uh, in the water at a point approximately 28.64 uh, degrees north, uh, 80.28 uh, degrees west. The worst fears of all of us we are in space you know, for a long time verification realized this morning at Cape uh, Canaveral. The location of the recovery forces in the field to, to see what uh, may be possible at this point. It appeared as if the uh, debris from the exploded Challenger shuttle came down. Uh, and we will keep you advised as uh, further information becomes available. This is Mission Control came down just a few miles offshore. So, of course, they will be rushing uh, boats out to that area to try to see what they can find. A most terrible sight, a most terrible event. Naturally, uh, a great deal of confusion as we try to piece together exactly what did happen. So far, there's been no specific word on uh, what caused the malfunction, what caused the explosion aboard Challenger. It just seemed to be going perfectly, and uh, we had uh, watched it leave. We had thought all was going well, and within 10 seconds after uh, our previous broadcast of the launch of Challenger, a bright orange flash in the sky. Uh, one piece of the rocket seemed to break off from the rest of the main assembly. The, the, the main engines were still going uh, on, uh, on the, on the uh, Challenger itself. And then this spark, it seemed, an ember almost, uh, flipped out to the side. And all of a sudden, the smoke contrails were no longer straight and true. They were haywire and going crazy in the sky. And it was obviously and immediately apparent that there was an, an awful disaster had just been uh, been made. Still now, uh, we can see that smoke as uh, the wind starts to carry it and its patterns are dispersed in the bright blue Florida sky. It was an absolutely perfect day for a launch and everything did seem to be going well and then all of a sudden it happened. Krista McAuliffe and her crewmates, the uh, pilot, uh, Mike Scobie, and... Uh, Astronauts uh, Smith and Michael Smith and Judy Resnick, a mission specialist who's flown before, Ellison Onizuka, a mission specialist he'd flown before, Ronald McNair, a black American astronaut, mission specialist he'd flown before, Gregory Jarvis, payload specialist, and S. Krista McAuliffe, 37 years old, Concord, New Hampshire, school teacher, high school at Concord High and uh, listed as a teacher observer on this flight, but of course she was more than that. She had been picked from over 10,000 teachers who applied to be the first uh, private American citizen in space, a, a flight uh, a mission which had been called for by President Reagan some time ago and had spent many months in training for this moment. And then uh, she and the rest of the crew had suffered many delays as the Challenger sat on the launch pad and waited out the weather for three days in a row, some mechanical snafus, which uh, at the time uh, we thought were embarrassing, but now, of course, that has all shrunk into insignificance alongside of this awful, awful tragedy. We can see people running from the uh, NASA headquarters building this here, control trying to get a better look out of the water. Recovery forces in the field. That news that the bring safety uh, equipment uh, Recovery vehicles uh, intended for the recovery of the SRB in the general area. Those parachutes are uh, believed to be uh, paramedics going into that area. Paramedics now parachuting into the Atlantic uh, in the area where the debris from Challenger fell. Chris, this is Judy Muller in New York. Hello, Judy. Repeat, we had a. Uh, we are following this with you. Apparently normal ascent with the data coming to all positions being normal up through approximately the time of uh, May 
16 engine uh, throttle back up to 104 percent. Mission control saying now that everything on the instrument readings uh, in the launch That's center seem to be looking all right. To the flight, uh, there was uh, an apparent ex explosion. The uh, flight dynamics officer reported that uh, tracking reported that the vehicle had exploded and impacted the water in an area approximately located at 28.64 degrees north, 80.28 degrees west. Recovery forces are proceeding to the area. Chris, we just saw the parachutes going into that area. Yes, Judy, those are, uh, according to Mission Control, they are, are paramedics who are parachuting into the area where the debris fell in the Atlantic. By controllers reviewing their data What they will find there is, uh, is not known. We will uh, provide you with more information as it becomes available. This is Mission Control, Houston. So about the uh, gleanings of that Mission Control report were that was that everything was looking nominal as far as the instruments were concerned and that this uh, apparent explosion aboard Challenger just happened in a flash with no forewarning and no, uh, no instrument uh, indication that anything was amiss as, as the uh, shuttle headed out downrange over the Atlantic in the first minute of its flight. Chris, as you know, the voice of NASA, the voice of mission control, whatever voice we hear, is always calm. But, but in this today, of course, we hear a, a different note of terrible. Well, it's a, it's a steely tone, I think, one that is, uh, you know, a forced calm and uh, the way you get when you are faced with an intensely uh, emotional and tragic situation and, and try very hard to cover it. And I must admit, I feel the same way. Here in New York, we see the pictures on the monitor of NASA that sends up of, of mission control and the faces in that room just tell it all. Certainly do. Grim, everybody sitting still, very little movement. This is the first such failure in 56 such man in space missions. Never before has there been one like it, and uh, I very much hope that there never will be again. We have come to accept this nominal idea. We're so used to things, except for minor glitches that we've been hearing about in recent launches, except for those minor glitches, we're so used to this going almost flawlessly that we, I think, have taken it for granted almost. That's true. The uh, hard part of this, is, I think, is that it, they plan so carefully for emergency situations. They can turn around immediately after launch and come back and land at the Kennedy Space Center if anything goes wrong. They can have an abort across the Atlantic at any one of numerous transatlantic landing sites in uh, Western Africa. They can abort once around the world and then come down again in, uh, in uh, California or even back here at the Cape if they have an emergency in the first orbit. They can abort to orbit if something goes wrong just before they get there. They can go up and get into a preliminary orbit and then see what they're going to do. As a matter of fact, in fact, they've done that once, but uh, to to have it happen without any warning whatsoever, uh, without with, any chance uh, with whatsoever. With all those computer backups, telling them when anything goes wrong, even a hatch problem, it, it's amazing that something wouldn't have shown up. I wonder in all that debris if they'll ever know. I don't know. I don't know how deep the water is at that point, but I imagine um, that it's probably still well within the limits of the continental shelf, and it's probably not too deep for salvage operations. Uh, there has been, of course, no official word on the fate of the crew, but um, from our vantage point and from what we could see, and we could see it all, albeit it was several miles away, uh, it did not look like they had a chance. Uh, it, it doesn't appear that any of them could have survived. This would be tragic if it involved anybody, a member of NASA, an astronaut, but it is especially tragic with the first civilian in space aboard. I imagine her family was watching, or is it the Cape? Indeed they were, husband and children. And many dignitaries from all over the country, and um, literally hundreds of educators and school kids who had come here to watch a person that had become something of a hero to them uh, uh, fly away into history. And uh, perhaps history was made here today, but it's not the pleasant variety, not the glorious variety at all.
This was to have been, of course, uh, NASA's most ambitious year. They had um, more than a dozen shuttle flights planned, which would far and away top the number that they've ever been able to launch in a single year before. What's going to happen to those plans now? What this is going to mean to America's uh, manned spaceflight program or to the space program in general, of course, remains to be seen. Right now, there's uh, no talk of that, only of determining what happened and getting the official word on the fate of the uh, seven-man crew. Chris, this happened just about a minute after launch. Did it not up to that point, since I was not there, could you describe what, did it look all right up to that point? Oh, it looked perfect. I, it looked like uh, every other space shuttle launch that I have ever seen, and I've seen about ten, I think, and uh, everything was going very smoothly. Uh, mission control was uh, sounding very, very confident. The shuttle was climbing up into a very clear, blue, cloudless Florida sky, and uh, all of a sudden, flash, and uh, the, the one bright flame that we can usually spot as the spacecraft carries out over the Atlantic for dozens and dozens of miles became two bright flames, and uh, it looked almost as if one of the solid rocket boosters had exploded uh, and split off from the spacecraft, uh, sending it, of course, in a, in a crazy spiraling pattern for a few seconds and then uh, debris started to fall out of the sky into the sea. Of course, they they have search and rescue recovery people standing by for all these missions, but it's almost become assumed that they would never go into action. It, it must be well, terrible for them, too. They've always been ready, and certainly they, they had... Uh, uh, people parachuting into the uh, crash site uh, in the in the water within, I would say, two or three minutes after the event. So uh, they were ready and uh, they they did perform as as they were supposed to. But there seems little chance that they'll find anybody alive out there. For those who may have just tuned in, could you go over who the crew members are again? Yes, of course. Um, Frank uh, Scobie, the commander of this mission. Michael Smith, the pilot. Judy Resnick, a mission specialist. Ellison Onizuka, a mission specialist. Ronald McNair, a black astronaut, also a mission specialist. Gregory Jarvis, who is a payload specialist. And uh, uh, Sharon Krista McAuliffe, a 37-year-old high school teacher from New Hampshire who was to have been America's first private citizen in space. And for those of us who have covered the space program for several years, some of those names are firsts in themselves. Ronald McNair, the first black astronaut in space. Judith Resnick was the second woman, I believe, in space, or third. She's among the first, certainly. Um, Dick Scobie, a veteran of space flights. Yes, he is. Well, mission uh, audio has been silent for a few minutes now, and... Uh, there has been no word specifically on what happened. Uh, all about all that uh, uh, the uh, mission uh, people have said is that uh, there was an explosion aboard the uh, aboard the shuttle Challenger, and of course the crew members at that point are very securely strapped into their seats. Uh, they have no uh, ejection seats or anything like that, any any kind of life-saving device like that, which you might expect to find in a fighter plane and. When something like that happens, it's, uh, it's just the end. There is nothing they can do about it. They don't wear parachutes. There wouldn't be any way for them to get out of the spacecraft if they had the chance to do that anyway. They're sealed in there until they land. As we see in, in NASA optics, uh, the Atlantic is just a stretch of blue calm belying what has just happened here. I see no debris. I see nothing as they scan the horizon there. No, I'm, I'm looking at that, uh, at that video picture, too, and uh, I can't see anything like that either. You mentioned the solid rocket booster seemed to explode well, and burst away. Well, I, I, was, I was, you know, tracking it with my eye, and um, it seemed that something popped out to the side. Another, another flaming rocket piece popped away to the side of the spacecraft, and the main body of it carried on for... Uh, uh, a little while longer and then started uh, gyrating and, and twisting in the sky and, and finally started plunging straight down. There were, of course, uh, there was, of course, a crowd of spectators in the stands. Hundreds of them. Hoping to celebrate Krista McAuliffe's triumph today. Yes, it was uh, pretty grim. I looked over that way uh, as soon as I could tear my eyes away from that terrible tragedy in, in the sky and... Uh, People were just 
just just leaving. I, you know, what what else could they do? They were getting out of the grandstands and and walking away. Uh, some of them seemed to be shaking their heads in disbelief, but uh, uh, there didn't seem to be any hysteria, no no running. Uh, they just, like I, could not believe what their eyes had just recorded in their minds. A terrible thing for you and everyone there, and. I think uh, it will take some time for the shock of this to sink in. Yes, indeed. Let's just um, recap here. Uh, we haven't gotten much additional information from uh, NASA recently, and uh, we'll just say that within uh, one minute of what appeared to be a perfect launch, there was an explosion this morning aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger carrying teacher Krista McAuliffe and six crew members to orbit. The rocket seemed to spin wildly in space for a few seconds and then plunged into the Atlantic. At the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, I'm Christopher Glenn, CBS News. This is Doug Poling. What appears to be a terrible tragedy at the Kennedy Space Center. The shuttle Challenger with seven crew members exploded shortly after it was launched about 20 minutes ago. Challenger exploded and went down in flames less than two minutes into launch. It went out of control and appears to have fallen into the ocean. We have no word on the fate of the crew. CBS News correspondent Christopher Glenn is at the Space Center. Chris, what can you tell us now? Doug, I was um, watching the launch. Everything appeared to be going well. We were doing our broadcast and had just signed off. And about 10 seconds later, this was about 45 or 50 seconds into the flight, uh, there appeared to be a, a, an orange flame shoot out from one side of the shuttle Challenger. It seemed uh, almost to split in two. The main body of the rocket then uh, went into some uh, gyrations for a few seconds, and then debris started falling down into the sea, and we could see it happen. It was indeed a terrible sight. It was terrible for the mission controllers, too, and this was their first reaction. We have heard Joe uh, looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously a major malfunction. We have no downlink. So that was the way Mission Control gave the news to the world. Um, that shuttle Challenger had exploded. Apparently all the crew members, uh, none of them did survive. All right, we hear the chips and helicopters have raced to the area around the control center, and we also hear that paramedics have... Uh, leaped into the water, apparently, to try to find any of the survivors. The crew members on this uh, uh, ship are Commander Dick Scobie, Pilot Mike Smith, and crew members Judy Resnick, Ellison Ozanuka, Ron McNair, and uh, Greg uh, Jarvis. Also, Kristen McAuliffe, a school teacher who was to become the nation's first civilian in space. At the White House, uh, Presidential uh, News Secretary, Assistant Secretary uh, Larry Speaks has uh, spoken just a few moments ago. And now we take you to what he had to say. The president is deeply concerned and, and shocked at uh, what he has just uh, seen replayed on television concerning the shuttle launch. Uh, we do not have any more information than is being provided to the public at this time. Uh, the way the federal president found out about it is he was uh, in the Oval Office uh, with a group of senior staff uh, preparing for some questions with uh, a group of network correspondents and anchors that were having lunch in the White House uh, today uh, regarding the budget and the State of the Union. The Vice President and the Foreign Policy Advisor John Poindexter uh, came in with others and informed the President that the news had just broken 
uh, we immediately adjourned our Oval Office meeting and went into an adjoining uh, room, the President's study, where there's a television, and the President then began to review television reports of the uh, explosion there shortly after the launch. So once again, the President is, is concerned, he is, uh, is, is saddened, he is uh, very uh, anxious to have more information on it at the moment, as I say, we're learning most of our information from what the public is getting. What is your as Larry speaks, the assistant uh, presidential news secretary, to recap and repeat what we know at this hour, the space shuttle Challenger exploded into a giant fireball just moments after liftoff about 25 minutes ago from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And apparently the crew members uh, might have been killed, at least that's the assumption at this point. There is no announcement. Oh, no official announcement about the fate of the crew. It appears to be no way they, they could survive at this uh, time. Uh, Christopher Glenn is at the uh, Kennedy Space Center, and uh, Chris, uh, what uh, can you tell us now? Doug, uh, very little else. Uh, as you might expect, the, uh, the uh, NASA people have been uh, very, very reticent with the information while they try to put together the details of this tragedy. Uh, they did tell us, uh, as you mentioned a little bit earlier, that um, uh, helicopters and rescue ships were on the way to the crash site, which appeared to be only a, a few miles offshore, uh, and that uh, paramedics had parachuted into the water. And also, as you mentioned, there, there doesn't seem to be much chance that anybody survived this wreck. Uh, there are no, uh, no emergency ejection systems or anything of the kind aboard the space shuttle. Uh, they have to fly uh, at least until uh, uh, the, the main rocket uh, cuts off, until they can, they can do anything. Uh, but this just, just happened in an instant, in a flash, without... NASA says without any indication that it was coming, the instrument readings were all normal at that point, and uh, it just exploded in the sky and came down. They never had a chance. It appears, of course, that the $1 billion spacecraft uh, Challenger was destroyed, and this is the first in-the-air disaster in 56 U.S. man and space missions, although three astronauts were killed in 1967 in a launch pad explosion during the Apollo program. The uh, crew members aboard Challenger today were uh, Francis Scobie, the commander, pilot Michael J. Smith, Judith Resnick, uh, Ronald McNair, Ellison Ona Zuka and Gregory Jarvis, and of course, uh, Krista McAuliffe, the 37-year-old school teacher from uh, New Hampshire who was uh, selected as America's first citizen in space. To repeat, the Space Shuttle Challenger has exploded shortly after liftoff from the uh, Kennedy Space Center, and apparently all seven astronauts aboard uh, were killed. We will have continued coverage of the Space Shuttle disaster over many of the CBS radio network stations. This is Doug Poling, CBS News. And this is Howard Viken here at Seashore Radio, seated here in our studios with Joyce Lamont and the whole staff is uh, yes. gathered around our radio speakers and uh, the TV sets uh, following this tragedy. Now, direct from CBS News, this Radio Net Alert Bulletin. This is Judy Muller in New York. The Space Shuttle Challenger exploded after liftoff today, apparently killing all seven crew members, including the first civilian to be launched into space, Krista McAuliffe. There is no announcement of the fate of the crew, but it appears that there could be no way they would survive. The spacecraft appears to be destroyed, the debris being scattered into the Atlantic Ocean, there is no clue right now as to what might have caused the explosion. There was no indication of any problems on the computers, in mission control. No one had any indication that was, anything was wrong. It was the first in-the-air disaster in 56 U.S. man-in-space missions, although three astronauts were killed in a 1967 launch pad explosion. That was during the Apollo program. Again, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded into a gigantic fireball moments after liftoff today, with many, many people gathered at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida in the grandstands where they gather to watch launches. Among those people were 
the school children, some school children, some of the family members. Christopher Glenn is at the Kennedy Space Center now. Chris, have we learned anything new? Well, uh, Judy, we do have with us now uh, NASA spokesman George Diller, and we're, perhaps we can get some additional information from him. George, can you add anything to the reports that we received from Mission Control? Uh, not, uh, not a great deal. Uh, one of the problems at this point is before we can send any emergency teams in to see what state uh, the orbiter is in, if it, it is in fact intact, uh, is that there is debris that falls from that altitude uh, that takes a considerable amount of time to impact the ocean. Uh, that is normally 15 minutes after any mishap. Um, the, uh, there is the possibility that we have gotten uh, some paramedics into that general area, but uh, most aircraft and ships will stay clear until the period of debris uh, has, uh, uh, has ended because the debris falling out of the sky obviously endangers the, uh, the, the planes and, and the ships uh, that would be going in to do whatever rescue attempt that can be done. So we don't know what the uh, state of the orbiter is at this time, and uh, as soon as... Uh, uh, by calculation, we know that the debris has uh, has cleared, and we can go in and uh, and check the impact area because we do know uh, from a flight dynamic standpoint where the vehicle has impacted. Can can you tell us where that would be? How how far offshore? Uh, it it appears to be about 20 miles off the uh, off the Cape. Uh, this this appeared to uh, have occurred as they were throttling back to go through the sound barrier through what we call Max Q, where you have the maximum stress on the vehicle. And uh, it, it appeared that we had an early solid rocket booster separation. Uh, we don't have any indication on on you know what the actual state of the solids were because we had good data on the solids and on the orbiter up until the time of the explosion. So everything is still very sketchy. Uh, I guess the big unknown at this point is whether or not the orbiter is intact. And uh, if it is, uh, we'll be having crews uh, go to the point where uh, it uh, has been tracked to impact. Now, this very painful question, uh, is it possible that anyone could have survived an accident like this? It, it depends on whether or not the orbiter is damaged. If the orbiter uh, did not explode and it is not seriously damaged, it will float for a period of time. Uh, if uh, if that, That's why we try to get crews in as, as soon as we can, because there is a period, uh, I believe, of about an hour where there's no problem. Now, uh, the to, to my eye, at any rate, it seemed as if uh, a part of the, of the rocket assembly came off at first, and, and the main portion of the rocket was still going forward for a few seconds. Uh, do your instrument readings give you any indication of exactly what, what part of the vehicle was involved in the explosion? Well, that, that's what I say when it appears that we had an early socket ro solid rocket booster separation. But we don't know if, it is one, if, if one of the solids exploded or what has actually exploded because all the data at the time that occurred was good from both the solid rocket boosters and from the main engines of the orbiter. So we don't know what happened. Judy Muller in New York, I understand you have a question for George. Judy? Yes. I, uh, President Reagan has been following developments, Chris, at the White House, and we're going to go to Gary Schuster at the White House now for a reaction. Gary? The President's spokesman just came out and told us that the President was preparing to meet with some uh, network correspondents in preparation for his uh, State of the Union address tonight. He was going to answer some questions and talk with them at a luncheon here in the White House. When just before he was about to uh, go into that luncheon, uh, his national security advisor, uh, Admiral Poindexter, came in and told him what had happened. The president and some senior aides then went in a study, which is right next to the Oval Office, we're told, and watched the repetition of the uh, blast off and the explosion, apparently, that occurred in air. And the president, as speaks, described them, just watched the television, the repeat of it, the, in almost stunned silence, uh, Mr. Speaks said you could almost see the sorrow and concern on the president's face. Uh, he said that basically that uh, they only know here what the news media is reporting. They've had no special reports from Florida, and uh, basically they they are getting their information from the news media as it becomes available. 
Gary, I guess the president is watching, as we all are, in, in shock and disbelief and waiting to find out if there's any possibility that that orbiter might have landed intact. And going back to Chris, that was a question, I, I suppose, that we will know uh, soon, will we not? Well, it's it's difficult to say. Um, if, as uh, NASA's George Diller has suggested to us a couple of moments ago, uh, there is the possibility that the orbiter, orbiter could have remained intact and plunged into the sea intact, uh, then it becomes a question of finding the orbiter. How deep is it? How quickly can we get divers down there to see what's going on? Now, don't forget at the same time that even if the orbiter were to have um, survived the explosion intact, it was falling from an enormous height with, uh, w I don't know exactly how high it was at the, at the moment of the explosion, but it was falling from a very, very great height and uh, gaining uh, uh, speed as it came down. And uh, when it impacted on the water, it would be sort of like uh, driving into a brick wall. Uh, it's not just a, a swan dive. It would be falling and, and impacting with enormous force on it. So even if it did survive intact, uh, what could be the likelihood that uh, anyone could have survived the fall from that height? I don't know the answer to that. George Diller of NASA doesn't know the answer to that. And uh, NASA, of course, is bending uh, every possible energy to try to find the answer to that question. We can hope for the best, but it does not look good. How long do you think it will be before they know one way or the other. Well, he said it was 20 miles uh, offshore or so, and they do have rescue teams on the site. Uh, I don't know how they are equipped or uh, whether they're equipped to do any deep sea diving. Um, I was surprised to hear him say that it, it takes about 15 minutes for something to fall from the sky at that, that altitude. It appeared to my eye as I watched the debris falling toward the Atlantic that it was uh, approaching the surface of the water much uh, much more rapidly than that. But, uh, of course, I could be wrong. I, I did not see anything large enough to appear to be the, the main body of the shuttle. George Diller mentioned that this happened when they were throttling back and that, of course, is when there's a l more stress on the spacecraft. That's right. Uh, max Q, they call it. It's the time in the launch uh, and, and liftoff uh, and early stages of the flight sequence when they are subject to the most dynamic pressure, the most, uh, the most vibration, the most uh, G forces on them. And uh, what uh, George Diller said to us was that it appeared that one of the two solid rocket boosters had separated prematurely from the side of the vehicle. There is a point early, relatively early in the flight within a uh, the first few minutes when those two solid rocket boosters are supposed uh, as a matter of the natural sequence to to uh, be blown away from the side of the uh, of the rocket assembly and fall into the sea to be recovered and brought back to uh, uh, Cape Canaveral for future use, use for, for reuse but this one appeared as if one of those uh, solid rocket motors which look kind of like um, large Roman candles strapped to the side of the main fuel tank had come off prematurely and gone its own separate way of course uh, if that was the case, uh, the dynamic equilibrium of the whole uh, vehicle would be thrown into a tizzy, and uh, uh, the rest of the uh, of the vehicle, the main portion of the vehicle, could could not fly anymore. It would just spin out of control and go down. Now we have in uh, the studio here with us now uh, uh, Jim Rivers, who is with uh, K WKXL in Concord, New Hampshire. They've been uh, sharing some of our office space here for the preparations for this flight. And uh, Jim, can you give us uh, your impressions of what's happened and how the folks in Concord must feel. Well, as you can, can expect, uh, Chris, utter utter shock uh, and, and the tragedy of the, the situation. From down to the, at this viewpoint, um, being my first time at, at seeing a shuttle launch, and, and for many of the, the rookies down here and watching the launch, you didn't know what to expect. And so when you saw the ball of fire, the first question was, well, is that what's supposed to happen? And then veterans were here. You could see just the, the, the fear come over their faces that, no, that isn't what was supposed to happen. Back at Concord High School, uh, party hats and noisemakers and New Year's Eve type of things had been handed out. The student body had lined into the, the auditorium, and it had become just a, a festive affair. From the moment the countdown got down to the final minute, the cheering began, and it began to build until liftoff. And even a, a minute in, when the explosion came, the cheering, and then all of a sudden, silence. And as uh, 
We checked with Concord High School moments ago. Uh, the auditorium is just littered with potty hats and noisemakers, and the students have, have filed out. The media has been asked to leave the high school. And, and you know, Chris, this is the second uh, tragedy in, in, of not quite as mammoth proportions that has uh, befallen Concord High School this year. They, they had an incident there earlier in the year that the student body had to, had to come together in a, in a shooting incident, and it's just been a, an extremely tough year on the student body at Concord High School. But the situation right now, as you would expect, in the city of Concord, not only for Krista McAuliffe, but for the entire crew is, is just pray to God that they're, they're out there somewhere. And the state of New Hampshire and the entire nation and uh, without a doubt the uh, entire world Chris? is uh, mourning this great tragedy. Yes, um, Judy. Among those uh, who are witnessing this today, President Reagan, and he was described as saddened by the events this morning. Just a few moments ago, White House spokesman Larry Speaks answered questions from reporters. The president's first priority is to find out what information uh, that is available. We just White don't. House with the we KPS. just don't have any more. Uh, no, we have not. Not from the Oval Office. Will this affect uh, in any way the plans for the State of the Union tonight? I don't believe so. I'm certain that the president uh, uh, will uh, will feel compelled to to mention this, depending on the outcome of what we learn here in a few minutes. Will it affect but, uh, the uh, shuttle program? Uh, well, that, that's hard to say. Uh, you know, here in 15 or 20 minutes after an incident of this type is concerned. I'm sure it will not affect uh, the United States' determination to consider uh, to continue the exploration of space and all the benefits we've received from it. Uh, while, the, while, 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 while this is, is indeed tragic, uh, it certainly uh, uh, will not deter the United States in its interest in space exploration. Well, all the problems that the shuttle has had, there was no any substantial reevaluation be done of the program itself. Well, once again, you're, you're very premature in answer, asking a question concerning the future uh, of the space program. Uh, the United States has has met adversity uh, many times before in the space program. It is one of the most effective and successful programs uh, uh, of that type that any country has ever undertaken. Larry, can you tell us anything specifically that the president said, any quotations, and did he make any mention of the fact that uh, the teacher that uh, he, he suggested, uh, that the program of a teacher in space, that that teacher was on board this flight? Well, I know that was on his mind. Quite frankly, the president was stood there in almost stunned silence as he watched the television. Uh, you could uh, you could certainly read uh, the concern, uh, the sorrow, uh, the anxiety. Uh, on his face as he watched uh, and the group watched around him as I say he was he was virtually watched in silence might anyone from the White House uh, be leading some sort of investigating team or will it just be up to NASA to investigate this all this is is very very early and there's just nothing we can say our, our immediate concern is the is the crew and uh, and all of these other questions will just have to be deferred we were listening to Larry Speaks answering questions from reporters just moments ago at the White House about this tragedy and the explosion of the Challenger after liftoff today at Cape Canaveral. Gary Schuster's at the White House. Gary, Larry Speaks said that this accident won't deter future space exploration, but one can't help wonder how far it will be set back. Well, that's right, Judy, and I think Mr. Speaks perhaps was a little premature in saying that. Uh, of course, the administration has always... Uh, been in the the forefront of, of pushing space exploration, but uh, with with this accident, uh, you, you just don't know where it's going to go. And I think uh, I think before any definite idea is given as to where it, where it will lead, uh, it'll, it'll take a complete examination of this uh, this accident. Thanks, Gary. In Gainesville, Florida, about 150 miles from the Cape, Gene Craven watched the liftoff from a rooftop. Watched. I get several liftoffs on the roof up there, and today we figured that it was going to be an exceptional view because it was absolutely clear. And um, about 30 seconds or so after it cleared the horizon, uh, there was a bright flash, and we could see flame going off in three directions, and then nothing. And I knew that something was seriously wrong, having seen several liftoffs before because on a clear day we would have been able to watch the, the flame of the booster for much longer. So we just saw the explosion and then flame going in three directions and then nothing but uh, the smoke from the exhaust. We were kind of taking it for granted. You were just kind of looking for the view. I mean, yeah, well, we've seen so many um, so many launches that everything's gone pretty well that uh, 
yeah, we were just up there for the view. But when I saw that explosion and uh, uh, pieces going off in several directions, well, we knew something was seriously wrong. Florida resident Jean Craven, one of many shocked eyewitnesses of today's tragic launch. Among those, of course, watching was Christopher Glenn. Chris, anything new from the Cape at all? Now, uh, Judy, it's, uh, it's really, it's calm here. Of course, we're sitting uh, in the position from which we la watch the space launches, and uh, it, it's a benign-looking scene. About the only uh, reminder of this tragedy within our uh, eyes' range is uh, uh, there are still the traces of those awful clouds that formed uh, as the rocket exploded, still drifting in the sky, no wind today uh, to push them out of the way. NASA has almost approximately, uh, seemed cursed in the last uh, few launches, this being, of course, the uh, most tragic possible outcome uh, so of uh, um, a planned mission. But things have just been going so badly for them, and this is bound to set back the program, it, it would seem to me it'd be a long time before they send another civilian into space. I don't think they'll be sending anybody into space for quite a while, Judy. Uh, a tragedy of this type um, is... It will be a long time in the analysis stage as to why it happened, and um, it's not like if you fall off a horse, you get right back up on it and ride it again. This thing will be analyzed uh, to the nth degree, and it probably will be many, many months before we see another manned space flight again, I would imagine. We're getting some information from Mission Control now. Let's listen. At the time, data stopped. Recovery forces being deployed to the field. Being, um, they're unable, were unable uh, shortly to uh, to enter the specific area because of a continuing falling debris, and at about this time are being admitted uh, to the impact area. Contingency procedures are in effect, and following those procedures, all of the data uh, available in, in mission control uh, from the flight at the point uh, or up to the point of the incident. Uh, data is being secured and will be carefully evaluated. Chris, I we have no additional information at this time, and we'll keep you advised as other details become available. This is Mission Control, Houston. That report uh, not not adding very much uh, new to the cause of the explosion. Although, but, yes, Judy. Chris, it's amazing to me that the debris was still falling, that they had to stay out of that area this long. Well, as uh, NASA's George Diller told us a few minutes ago when he was here in the studio with us, um, it, it would take about 15 minutes for all of the debris to fall from that altitude and impact on the surface of the ocean. Uh, Diller also indicated the, the only thing, the only indication we have of what exactly went wrong, uh, he said that it appears that one of the solid rocket boosters uh, uh, separated from the main launch vehicle a little bit early, as a matter of fact, a lot early, and, of course, that uh, that would make the rest of the rocket, all motors firing at full thrust, uh, go awry. It would just fly around wildly until uh, it finally they were able to get it, get the motors cut off, and it just fell into the sea. The last tragedy uh, anywhere near this magnitude, of course, was the, um, the Apollo launch explosion. That was on the pad when which Gus Grissom, Edward White, and Roger Chafee were killed. Yes, that was not a space flight. It was a training mission. It was a static uh, Apollo module and um, the situation at that point, I think it was in 1967 if I'm not mistaken, was that um, uh, there was a flash fire inside the command module, the Apollo command module, and before anybody knew what was happening or they could get them out, they were all asphyxiated and subsequently burned to death. It was, interestingly enough, January 27th, 1967. Nineteen years ago. Exactly. I, there, uh, there never has been, to my uh, recollection, any um, spaceflight tragedy of, these dimen of this dimension uh, in the history of manned spaceflight for any nation. Uh, of course, the United States has never had uh, anyone die in, in flight before. Only those, uh, those three, uh, Chafee, White, and Grissom, who died on the pad here at, at Cape Canaveral. Um, 
but the Soviets did have a couple of, of losses uh, of life. Uh, I seem to recall some time back, and I'm, I'm picking my memory for 15-year-old details here, but uh, two cosmonauts were killed on a landing attempt. Something went wrong there, and of course the Soviets are, are very hesitant about uh, explaining publicly any tragedies, and even at the time there was very little information on that, but I, I do recall that happened. And that's about the, uh, the worst previous in-flight manned spaceflight incident I, I can think of. Now, um, Judy, we do have George Diller back here with us uh, at this point uh, of NASA, and perhaps, George, you could give us some additional information. Well, what we've done at the Launch Control Center is to impound the data. Uh, the firing room uh, has been sealed. The personnel uh, in the firing room will not be allowed to leave and all, until all of the, uh, uh, the data has been uh, impounded so that it can be uh, studied uh, you know, when we go into a, a review of this. Uh, the, uh, the incident occurred about 18 miles downrange, but that is not where the debris is. Uh, we calculate uh, by uh, computer where, if there is a mishap, where the vehicle will impact the water should thrust terminate at some point. That appears to have happened somewhere uh, uh, up to about 60 miles offshore. Uh, the, uh, the debris does appear to have cleared at this time, and they are sending in um, crews now to see whether or not the orbiter may by some chance be intact. And uh, we don't know what state the orbiter itself is in, so it's premature to speculate that we've lost it. We really don't know. Mm -hmm. at, uh, given a fall of a, of a body that massive from that great altitude, uh, is it possible it could have survived the impact in one piece? Uh, well, it, it depends on, uh, you know, what the nature of the explosion was. Was it the solid rocket boosters or was it the orbiter? Uh, if uh, the explosion uh, occurred uh, after we had separation, although it appears that it did not, uh, and the orbiter was in any kind of uh, you know flyable shape, we have uh, ditching maneuvers and the orbiter could float for up to an hour if, uh, if it's intact and not damaged. Now, if the orbiter's damaged, then how long it will float for is undetermined. Let me ask you a couple of technical questions. Um, after your instruments indicated that there had been a mishap, um, was there a cutoff of the other uh, motors? Were any switches thrown either by computer or by human hands to uh, turn off the rockets, so to speak? And secondly, um, is there any way, uh, if the shuttle was still attached to the huge external tank that it clings to upon launch and which later drops away, uh, any way they could have gotten separated um, from, the ma from the main tank so they might have some uh, aerodynamic control coming down if they survived the explosion? Uh, when you go into a return to launch site uh, abort procedure. It, uh, it, it is part of that uh, computerized program to jettison the external tank. Uh, there is a program point in flight where the solids are separated and then the tank is separated uh, to give the orbiter the maximum amount of loft to come back to the runway. It does not appear that we had time to implement that program fully. So that's why they're uh, in a scenario where if the vehicle's intact, it, uh, it may have ditched. But we don't have any control of the shuttle uh, as far as onboard systems. That's all being handled onboard the spacecraft. And uh, there is nothing uh, you know, that we do to, uh, to control the vehicle after it's in flight. But uh, it, uh, it appears that uh, at the time that we lost contact with it, that everything was normal. We don't see any anomalies in the boosters or in the main engine data that indicated that anything was wrong. It just happened. So, you know, it's not knowing what happened. We don't know what shape the orbiter's in. One of the um, earliest words that we got from uh, mission control after the accident uh, was that all communication with the spacecraft had been lost. Um, was that uh, automatic, instantaneous? Did it just stop all of a sudden? That appears to be the case. Now, is that all telemetry, telemetry or just correct. a all, voice communication? All voice and telemetry stopped at a, at a given point, apparently at about a minute 12. Uh -huh. And what altitude would the uh, rocket assembly have reached at that point? Uh, I, I'm not certain. I think they're at about 30 miles in altitude at that point. But uh, what they were, what they were doing was was uh, they they had completed going through the sound barrier. They had throttled back, uh, had completed that max Q transition, the, the maximum period of dynamic pressure, which is a load on on the wings and on the vehicle, and then had begun to accelerate up to 108 percent and have apparently achieved that point. Uh, it is unclear whether or not the uh, increase in acceleration is in any way related to the explosion because we don't know yet what exploded. Mm -hmm. Uh, earlier when you were uh, speaking with us um, about 25 minutes ago or so, um, you had said that you, you, you thought that perhaps 
one of the two solid rocket boosters had had an early separation. Um, if that were the case, how would that be possible? I mean, what? Well, normally, what happens when you have a uh, uh, a mishap is that one of the, the first things that occurs is to so separate the solid rocket boosters. Uh, early on, it was not real clear whether or not the boosters had separated before or after the explosion occurred. Uh, and I, I, I still don't think that's clear. It, it appears, in, in looking, you know, at the tape that we've seen, that everything happened all at one time. That it essentially was a self-destruct kind of thing. And that if the brief boost, if the boosters separated, uh, they uh, they separated only after. Uh, a computer program had become aware that there was a problem and instructed the, boot, the boosters to separate. Mm -hmm. Now, you say that uh, all of the data um, from the flight has been impounded for analysis. Uh, when might, might we get some uh, preliminary word on, uh, on the results of that analysis, do you think? That's uh, liable to be a long time in coming. If it's talking about days or weeks or... Oh, it'll be months. Months. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not something we may have a quick look uh, that where we can advance some theories but uh, it will be several months before uh, there are any conclusions and as far as the um, the very ambitious schedule that NASA had laid out for the shuttle uh, flights this year what happens now is everything automatically canceled or uh, well I think that's an announcement that would have to be made by the NASA administrator but uh, it's very unlikely that we would be doing any flying before we understand what's happened all right, NASA's George Diller, a spokesman for NASA, and um, of course, uh, uh, upset as I am, and everybody who uh, saw this Chris. ungodly thing happen in the sky in front of our eyes is at the moment, and thank you for being with us once again, George, and shedding some light on this uh, enormous and awful tragedy. This is Christopher Glenn at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and if I may just br briefly recap, uh, about one minute into this morning's flight of Shuttle Challenger, carrying uh, school teacher Krista McAuliffe, the first American citizen in space, uh, first American private citizen in space, and her six uh, crewmates. Uh, there appeared to be an explosion in the air about uh, 18 miles down range, and um, the rocket went haywire, s spun around in the sky a few times, and then fell toward the sea. Uh, it is uh, NASA's uh, hope that to somehow, some way, the orbiter survived the explosion, the orbiter itself survived the explosion intact, and might have been able to perform a successful ditch in the Atlantic. Uh, rescue teams are moving to the uh, crash site now, and uh, what they will find there is... Uh, uh, is anyone's guess at this point, but uh, from the eyeball view of it and from all indications so far, the lack of communication, anything else, it did, did not appear that anyone survived uh, the explosion this morning. I'm Christopher Gwen, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This is Judy Muller in New York as Chris has been trying to glean clues into why this has happened, the technical aspects. We've been hearing more and more about the human tragedy of this. The students at Krista McAuliffe's Concord High School in New Hampshire were cheering the launch when a teacher yelled for them to be silent because something appeared to be wrong. And as it became clear that there was an explosion, the students murmured, this can't be real, we can't be watching this. Students were ordered back to their rooms. Many of them protested that they wanted to continue watching. McAuliffe's husband and her two children, age six and nine, were thought to be watching the launch from a special viewing area at Cape Canaveral. A few minutes ago, we spoke with Concord, New Hampshire Junior High School principal Chris Rath. She is a friend of Chris and McAuliffe and watched the lift off this morning with students at the school. Most of our youngsters were either in class or in a, a cafeteria where the entire 8th grade eats together. And we had the television on, and it, we delayed the bell so that they could watch the, the launch. And as we all watched it, the kids cheered wildly and jumped up. And then there was kind of a period of time where we started to dismiss them to go to the next period of class. Uh, yet those closest to the TV kept watching, and a youngster said to me, Mrs. Rath, it just blew up. And I said, no, no, I wasn't watching. I said, it must be the, the rockets coming off. They make, they sometimes look like something exploded. And then I looked over and one of the teachers turned around and just shook his head and he said, no, it blew up. And at that point, there was just kind of a stunned feeling. Our youngsters continued, <laughs> being well-trained, continued to go to the next period class. At that time, we made an announcement throughout the building. And right now, the ninth grade is in the cafeteria eating, watching. Most of the youngsters are in the classroom with a teacher. Um, either listening to it on a radio or watching television as quite a, kind of a, a quiet period. 
um, we have a number of upset youngsters. We have some counselors in the building who are starting to form groups of youngsters who just need to talk about it. And we'll probably need to do that with some staff, all many of whom know Krista. She taught here a, a number of years ago and only for a short time, but she clearly has been a town celebrity and people have a lot vested in this space shuttle and I think feel a tremendous mixture of feelings. I know I do at this point. I talked to Krista last summer when she was applying and we kind of joked about it and and I said, if, you know, I, I don't even like going up in an elevator, Krista, how can you be doing this? And she was, all, as she is, she was very bubbly and, and said, oh, I, you know, I've got to fill out this application, something I just have to do. And I've seen her periodically over the fall, very short periods of time. And um, she, as she always comes across, that is the way Krista is. She was always very enthusiastic. And even we sat together and watched a youth hockey game not long ago, and she was tired. And she really point wanted to know all the town news and wasn't talking so much about her net news as much as our town news and so there is a, a tremendous mixture of feelings as you soared to the heights with this success and and wonderful accomplishment of somebody you know and then have to watch it all come to pieces in front of your eyes that's chris rath the principal of roundlet junior high school in concord and she's a friend of krista mcculloch uh, she says, as we heard, that she had even kidded Krista about the danger. Of course, in addition to Krista McAuliffe, uh, the, t the first teacher in space, the crew included Commander Dick Scobie, Pilot Mike Smith, Ron McNair, Greg Jarvis, Ellison Onizuka, and Judy Resnick. Several of those people, veterans of space travel. But of course, at the time when Challenger exploded, all the expertise and all the training and all the skill in the world couldn't have helped them. This was out of their hands. Chris Fraser, a CBS radio affiliate WKXL, was at Concord High School in New Hampshire this morning to cover the shuttle liftoff. To say uh, everything is extremely upset right here. Um, they have asked the students to leave the auditorium. Um, there are uh, spent uh, noisemakers uh, littering the floor right now. Um, the children walked out of the auditorium in more or less a state of shock, needless to say. Uh, no one knew what happened right when it went up. Uh, as Jim said, when the second uh, explosion more or less happened, everyone thought it was just part of the maybe a booster or something. No one knew. Everyone was cheering as the launch went up. Um, the students were asked to leave as soon as the explosion was announced. The students were asked to go back to the class, and the media uh, has been asked to clear out. Um, as I said, uh, the streamers and confetti littering the floor here right now. Everyone is uh, extremely upset. When, as soon as there, there was noise continuing throughout the launch, everyone was screaming. As soon as the word uh, that something went wrong, the room became uh, absolutely silent. There, there was not a word spoken by anyone. The students filed out in absolute silence. And many of them uh, just with, with shocked, stunned look at their face. I had asked um, yesterday and today many of the students uh, if they thought, if they were at all nervous, uh, aside from being just excited that Krista McAuliffe was, was going into space, and, and I didn't have one student tell me that they were worried or concerned. Uh, I guess these things have just become so routine that the thought of, of danger uh, never even enters anyone's mind. Chris Fraser, a teacher's triumph turned tragedy in a matter of minutes. Christopher Glenn at the Kennedy Space Center is talking has been talking with somebody from Krista McAuliffe's hometown. Chris? Yes, it's uh, Jim Rivers of WKXL, also um, the uh, Concord, uh, New Hampshire station, uh, who's been down here to uh, to take a look at the launch and uh, has been sharing some of our studio space with us. Jim, uh, uh, any any further insight into the uh, way uh, Concord feels about this? Well, again, uh, Chris, as we mentioned earlier, the, I've been in contact with the city, um, and it's, it's desolate. Everyone... Uh, we talked to a caller on our talk show this morning, and he said you thought that the town had been evacuated. Everybody was in front of TVs, and so this is an event that, that people aren't just going to read about in the papers. It's something that everybody saw as it happened. And a lot of us in Concord are rookies, as I said earlier, in, in seeing this. And, and as Chris Frazier has indicated, when we saw the, the ball of fire, we all thought it was part of, of the whole event. And everybody is just sitting back and praying and, and hoping that there are seven people out there in the water somewhere. We've had a couple of calls uh, to the studio here in the building uh, in the last few minutes from concerned people. Uh, we had a call from a, a young boy who wanted to talk to someone and, and asked if the apple 
had anything to do with it. It, it just thoughts that are going through people's mind. It, a, 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 a member of the closeout team uh, outside the rocket just before Krista McAuliffe got aboard this morning handed her an apple for the teacher. Yeah, yes. and then this young this young listener said, oh, "Did anyone check the apple?" So everybody's saying, "Why? What happened? What went wrong at this point?" Well, as we heard from NASA's George Diller, it may be. Um, months literally before we get any firm answers to that uh, he did have an indication uh, at least he, he, he said it appeared that uh, one of the solid rocket boosters on the rocket assembly had a premature separation and thereby unstabilized the dynamic configuration of the rest of the flight um, Jim what do you suppose will happen in Concord as a result of this uh, looking beyond the immediate uh, astonishment and, and the stunned uh, nature of the people up there what what will happen in the weeks ahead in Concord, do you think? Uh, the, the city of Concord is a, a strong community. They've, they've been through things like this uh, in the past, and, and they'll survive and go on and go on living. But it's gonna, I think it's going to be a long period of, of mourning uh, for Krista McAuliffe and her crewmates. And, and I'm not sure if we will ever totally uh, recover from this. Uh, because, as I say, everybody in the community, bar probably none at the point of liftoff, were watching or listening, and everybody found out together. Yes. Uh, yesterday, of course, uh, New Hampshire's young governor, John Sununu, was, was down here hoping to watch the launch, and then they had uh, a weather delay yesterday, and he had to go uh, go back to Concord um, last night. Um, is there any word from him yet about this? He has not made a statement yet. We uh, expect uh, to hear from him soon. I know that uh, we, uh, our news department have been in touch with his office, and he uh, will be coming out with a, a statement. A lot of the people in Concord, the school superintendent, uh, uh, Mark Bovey, the school uh, board president Mike Dunn were down here. They have gone home. I talked with Susan Anderson, uh, a team teacher uh, out in Idaho at, with Barbara Morgan. Uh, Idaho people were down here. They've all gone home to watch it on TV. Well, it was about uh, an hour and two minutes ago that Shuttle Challenger, less than uh, a minute and a half off the launch pad, exploded in flight. The uh, fate of the crew still officially unknown, how explosion, uh, it was an awful long way down, and um, uh, the water there is quite deep. They're about 20 miles offshore, so it's going to be a long time before we get any information on uh, what has happened to the crew, but it does not appear uh, too bright for their survival at this point. Judy Muller in New York. Yes, Chris, uh, CBS News correspondent Ike Pappas in Washington is in the office right now of the congressman who was on the previous shuttle flight, Congressman Nelson. Ike? Yeah, I'm listening. What is Congressman Nelson's reaction to this? Well, Congressman Nelson, Bill Nelson, the Florida Democrat, who only nine days ago returned uh, to Earth aboard the uh, challenge, the uh, Columbia, sat uh, in his office watching the liftoff of the next shuttle, Challenger, on a closed-circuit NASA monitor. Congressman Nelson has not emerged from the office as yet, but his press secretary is telling us that when the explosion occurred, there was nothing but silence in the room. Congressman Nelson is the uh, chairman of the uh, Space Science and Technology uh, Subcommittee. He is meeting with the staff of that subcommittee at the moment. Uh, his press secretary says that uh, no one said a word in the room. Uh, comments will have to wait, according to Congressman Nelson. Uh, Congressman Nelson is quoted as saying, I need time to get everything together. So he has scheduled a 3 o'clock news conference today when he can possibly shed a little bit more light on what occurred uh, aboard that uh, shuttle. Uh, Congressman Nelson, you know, understands the frustrations that uh, must have uh, been felt by the crew members of the Challenger, including uh, the Mrs. McAuliffe, because uh, it took, I believe, if my uh, memory serves me, um, I guess seven scrubs they went through on Columbia, and... Uh, and then it took them, I guess, three or four times before they could safely come down aboard Columbia. So he understands what the frustrations were and probably what the perils were in this kind of a mission. So for the moment, I think we have to wait to see what Congressman Nelson discovers and what his reactions to this event are. Like, despite the tragedy that the president reportedly plans to go ahead with his uh, State of the Union message tonight, um, and Larry Speaks said, I'm certain the president will feel compelled to mention this, and depending on the outcome. I imagine Senator Jake Garn will be following events today with some interest, too, as he was the first 
politician to go into space. Absolutely. I uh, believe that Senator Garn, as a matter of fact, has scheduled a news conference for uh, 15 minutes from now and uh, will be uh, giving his reactions and uh, telling us uh, perhaps what he knows about uh, and what he has learned from NASA because these astronauts are tied, uh, I guess, uh, in perpetuity to uh, the NASA control center for every launch because they, uh, they can contribute and they can learn uh, from these launches themselves even if they have been in space. And I'm sure that Senator Garn uh, is feeling what Senator Nelson is feeling. I'm sorry, uh, Congressman Nelson is feeling, and uh, uh, people who are feeling all over uh, the world who have been close and to this uh, space program, and those of us who have covered uh, the space uh, program over the years are feeling a great sense of tragedy and loss at this moment, and there's no question, although Bill Nelson has not articulated that yet, there's no question from the tone, from the mood, from the sense, from the atmosphere in his office that there is a, a, a great aura of, uh, of grief and, uh, and uh, dismay at this event, and certainly the president is going to it should be assumed that he will he will certainly mention this in some form this evening. Mike Pavis on Capitol Hill. CBS News Pentagon correspondent uh, Chris Kelly is also standing by. Chris, what have you learned there at the Pentagon? Uh, so far, the main recovery effort seems to be uh, underway by the Coast Guard. They have a couple of ships in the area there, along with aircraft availability uh, to see what they can uh, achieve there. Uh, at the same time, the Navy says two ships that happened to be in the general vicinity, they weren't there on station, they weren't there on duty, but they were in the general location, are now rushing toward the disaster area. One, we're told, is about 45 minutes away, a hydrofoil which carries about 21 men. Another ship, a U.S. Uh, guided missile frigate with 200 men, is steaming toward the location, but uh, that ship is uh, a good two hours away. So uh, they will, the Navy will go there, assist the Coast Guard in whatever recovery and search efforts uh, they can uh, they can achieve. Uh, in addition to that, uh, a Navy official said that. As best they could tell, there were no Soviet ships in the immediate area. Uh, we don't know if the Soviets this time were off the Florida coast, well off the Florida coast, I should say, watching this launch. They have been out there in the past. Whether they were there this time is unknown, but at least we know in this case that there are uh, no Soviet ships in the immediate area of the disaster, and uh, as best the Navy can tell, there were no ships uh, anywhere around because, of course, that area had been cleared prior to the launch. Judy? Thanks, Chris. I'd like to ask you to stand by for just a moment. We need to go down to the Cape now. Uh, Christopher Glenn has been trying to follow developments. Chris? Uh, yes, Judy. We just uh, had another uh, report from uh, Mission Control while you were talking with Chris Kelly. And uh, we're, it just it has concluded, and we're going to turn that tape around for you and play that back in just a moment here. Uh, Jim Rivers of Station WKXL in Concord, who's been speaking with us, uh, has been down here for the launch and uh, has been speaking with us about the reaction in Concord, has told me uh, a moment ago that uh, students at Concord High School who had been gathered in the auditorium to watch a large screen TV uh, version of the, of the uh, launch and had been cheering and saw this thing happen in front of their eyes uh, have now been dismissed for the day. Uh, as of 1 o'clock, and they will go home to be with their families. Now, we have this tape uh, just within the last two minutes or so for Mission Control. Let's hear that. This is Mission Control Houston at 11.48 a.m. Central Standard Time. Recovery teams are um, searching the impact area off the coast of uh, launch pad, uh, launch pad uh, 39B, where uh, earlier this morning on ascent we had... Uh, an incident uh, approximately one minute after uh, ascent, uh, an apparent explosion as the, uh, the space shuttle had uh, shortly uh, before uh, reached uh, a throttle back uh, position. The uh, range safety teams uh, were unable to get uh, the, uh, rather the uh, uh, rescue teams, the search and rescue teams uh, delayed in getting into the area because of debris continuing to fall uh, from uh, very high altitudes uh, for as long, uh, almost as an hour uh, after, uh, after ascent. Those teams uh, in place now uh, in the search area. Uh, 
that uh, additional information as it becomes available to us. This is Mission Control, Houston. So again, a, uh, a rather skimpy report from uh, Mission Control on what they know right at the moment. Uh, we're looking at pictures provided by NASA cameras aboard uh, a helicopter, apparently, in the search area. Uh, about 20 miles offshore, and uh, they do show some yellowish streaks in the water, but no uh, visible wreckage or debris of any kind. Uh, presume that some of those uh, those yellow streaks are chemical residue from uh, from the main fuel tank or from the orbiter's uh, fuel tanks itself. Uh, one very poignant shot that they had was looking back over the water uh, toward the land and uh, in the very distant horizon you can see the very noticeable uh, beacon and profile of the um, uh, vehicle assembly building where they put these things together in a vertical configuration and then roll them out to the launch pad. Uh, but uh, as of now we know very little else about the fate of the crew members except to it's uh, probable that uh, none of them survived this uh, this tragedy today. And we do have um, some word from uh, NASA spokesman Jim Mizell, which has been gathered on tape, and we'd like to uh, play that tape for you now. Uh, everything looked perfectly normal, and uh, it looked like in about one minute into the flight. And at that point, uh, it appeared to uh, have a disintegration of a part of the shuttle system. At that time, we could not tell whether it was a solid rocket booster or the main orbiter or anything else. Uh, my first impression was that we were getting ready to have a perform a, a return to landing site because uh, something occurring at that point is normally what would have occurred. Um, in a few moments, it became obvious that, uh, that we could see nothing coming out of the the uh, explosion that was headed back toward Kennedy Space Center. So uh, it became obvious that uh, the pieces were going to fall in the ocean. And from that point on, uh, that's about all the data that we had. We did hear that uh, there was some impact of some uh, of the orbiter somewhere 20 miles downrange. And the Air Force has dispatched helicopters to the site. And uh, we have no report as to what they have found, or we have had no report on uh, the cause of the apparent explosion. Uh, Jim, was there any indication at all that the shuttle was in distress at any point? Uh, from what we have heard from uh, Mission Control and uh, from the engineering people, at this time, uh, there was no indication as to what occurred. Um, there was uh, a statement that there was an explosion, and uh, really that uh, the statement was not very clear as to exactly where did the explosion take place and why. So I think they're going to be evaluating data for quite some time before they release any information, and uh, certainly they're going to have to uh, hear from those people uh, in the rescue area before there any, can be any speculation as to uh, the status of the crew or the orbiter. Jim, tell us about that what is rescue operation. Tell us where the paramedics were flown in from, and tell us about the operation. Well, as you're well aware, we launch into a section of the ocean that is controlled by uh, uh, central control for the Air Force. It's the Eastern Test Range, and this is all controlled by Patrick Air Force Base, and they have a range safety control at Cape Canaveral. Uh, we had a helicopter force uh, on standby that uh, normally patrols this area doing missions or doing shuttle launches, and those same helicopters were available and were in patrol at that time. And uh, this is not something than we do for this mission, but we do it for every mission. So the Air Force really handles all of our search and rescue as far as any contingency or emergency operations are concerned. And uh, that plan was put into effect immediately as soon as it became apparent that something was wrong. And um, at the present time, uh, we have not heard from them on any anything decisive as to uh, what they found or what they're, what they're seeing at that point out there. Have there been any indications at all from the rescue team? There have not been any indications at this time, to my knowledge, uh, of course, uh, I suspect they are setting up a, a team to evaluate uh, what's going on, and they probably are much in closer touch with the uh, rescue team than we are here. In order to get spokesman Jim Mizell, thank you. And that tape um, uh, provided by uh, Frank Motek of our uh, Miami affiliate WINZ, and Frank, you're in the uh, studio with me now. Um, did you find out anything over uh, else over there at the press center? At the moment, uh, they're still trying to learn as much as they can from the rescue team that has been dispatched to the area. Uh, the faces still uh, tell the story of uh, shock and disbelief. At this point, everyone is waiting to get more information from that team that's been sent out there. 
a couple of other things I think we ought to mention at this point. Um, this launch of Challenger this morning was um, uh, from a new shuttle launch pad a couple of miles due north of the one that they've used for all of the previous shuttle launches. Uh, everything there had checked out perfectly, and of course, since the explosion occurred uh, a minute and 15 or 12 seconds into the flight, uh, there, that didn't really seem to have anything to do with it. Uh, the, the new um, launch pad was supposed to give NASA a much greater uh, flexibility for this year's crowded launch schedule, but of course at this point it doesn't appear that they will have a crowded launch schedule uh, at any rate. There also had been a number of days of delays of this launch uh, as NASA exercising its uh, customary caution uh, would not fly when it was raining, they would not fly when the crosswinds on the ground were blowing too hard. That was yesterday. There was a brief hold up for an hour this morning before launch while they waited for ice to clear off of the shuttle vehicle and of course none of those factors seem to enter in it, into it either. Judy Muller in New York. To recap once again, the space shuttle Challenger exploded about two minutes after liftoff from Cape Canaveral and plunged into the Atlantic some 60 miles away. The fate of the seven-member crew, including teacher Krista McAuliffe, is unknown, but it's unlikely that any of the astronauts have survived. We do not know that for sure. It appeared the rocket booster may have separated prematurely and exploded, but that is not known for sure. In fact, nothing is known for sure. In the words of NASA spokesman George Diller, it just happened. In addition to McAuliffe, a teacher from Concord, New Hampshire, the crew includes Commander Dick Scobie, Pilot Mike Smith, Ron McNair, Grave Jarvis, Ellison Onizuka, and Judy Resnick. The Senate has scheduled a prayer session for this afternoon. The White House, as President Reagan watched in silence, a replay of the accident. Uh, the president was described as saddened and anxious to have more information as the nation is saddened in shock and we fear a nation in mourning. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Judy Muller, CBS News. CBS News, I'm Dick Reeves. Well, there was a bright flash, and we could see flame going off in three directions, and then nothing. A horrified eyewitness to the space tragedy at Cape Canaveral, the shuttle Challenger exploding in the skies over the Atlantic about a minute after liftoff, apparently killing all seven people on board, including New Hampshire high school teacher Krista McCullough. Christopher Glenn is at the Cape. He was a witness to the disaster. Chris, do we know much more now than we did when the spacecraft blew up? No, we don't, Dick. Uh, at this point, uh, it's still rather inconclusive as to as to exactly what happened. Um, one of the NASA spokesmen speculated to us uh, a little while ago that it appeared as if uh, one of the solid rocket boosters, there are two of them on every um, rocket configuration for the shuttle that goes up, it appeared that one of them had separated from the rocket assembly prematurely and gone its own separate way, and uh, that, of course, caused the rest of the, uh, the spacecraft and the rockets to... Uh, run amok in the sky and uh, eventually for that assembly to fall into the ocean. It's not known at this time whether by some miracle the uh, 
uh, shuttle Challenger, the orbiter itself, was intact after the explosion and was somehow able to separate from the main fuel tank and the other solid rocket booster and somehow perform an aerodynamic glide down in and ditch at sea. Uh, we're looking at pictures from NASA cameras over the crash site uh, in the Atlantic right now, and all they show there is a few yellowish streaks in the water. It appears to be some kind of uh, chemical uh, uh, um, debris from the uh, from the uh, crash it, itself, perhaps uh, spent fuel or something like that. But uh, no sign of any large chunks of wreckage, and certainly no sign of the orbiter. Well, were there uh, efforts, obviously, to get the rescue people there, but it took some time, did it not? Yes, uh, they they had some people uh, nearby, but um, from the altitude at which the spacecraft was traveling uh, when the explosion occurred, it would take the debris, all of it, uh, some 15 minutes to fall into the sea. That was how, how high up in the air they were. So they were prevented from entering the actual crash site until uh, perhaps 15 or 20 minutes after the explosion and after they had to get underway to get out there. They just had to hang back and wait to go in until everything had finished falling from above them, which possibly could have hit them and compounded this tragedy. And of course, it seems so long, so agonizingly long since it happened, uh, that those of us who are waiting and hoping uh, wonder what's going to happen now, what will happen now. Now uh, NASA has impounded all of the telemetry, all of the data, and all of the voice tapes from the flight, and they will be analyzing them very carefully over the next days, over the next weeks, over the next months, and it may be a very long time indeed before we get any uh, official version of what happened here today. What was immediately apparent, as you said, was what we could see with our eyes, this rocket uh, which appeared to be going so well without warning even to the eye or to instruments of any kind just blew apart in the air. Does NASA plan any kind of an announcement, or is that sort of a constant process at this time? At this point, we're getting intermittent reports from Mission Control, uh, Dick, but um, they're not really adding too terribly much new information each time. Uh, there's no broad revelation uh, uh, at all uh, other than what we already know. Chris Glenn reporting from the Cape. Gene Craven was watching the launch from the third floor roof of the University of Florida, 150 miles away. I knew that something was seriously wrong, having seen several liftoffs before, because on a clear day we would have been able to watch the, the flame of the booster for much longer. So we just saw the explosion and then flame going in three directions and then nothing but uh, the smoke from the exhaust. In Washington, President Reagan was quickly told of the terrible event. Gary Schuster reports from the White House. White House spokesman Larry Speaks said President Reagan was informed of the accident at a meeting with aides in the Oval Office. He immediately went to his adjoining study and watched television reruns of the liftoff and the explosion. The president was stood there in almost stunned silence as he watched the television. Uh, you, could, uh, you could certainly read uh, the concern, uh, the sorrow, uh, the anxiety uh, on his face as he watched. Speaks said he didn't believe the accident would deter the American space exploration program. The presidential spokesman also said he didn't expect the accident to affect Mr. Reagan's State of the Union address tonight, except that the president would certainly make reference to the accident. Gary Schuster, CBS News, the White House. A friend of Krista McAuliffe, New Hampshire school, high school principal Chris Rath said amid all the excitement and preparation for the mission, no one gave much thought to the potential dangers. There's been a, a great deal of activity focused on the shuttle. We built an ice cream shuttle and the kids built an ice sculpture shuttle and we've really, we know the ins and outs of a shuttle and throughout all of that no one thought about that I don't think in terms of it is a dangerous expedition. It's still a frontier, and we haven't bastard it, and we saw that today. Recapping the story, the space shuttle Challenger exploded about one minute after liftoff from Cape Canaveral and plunged into the Atlantic Ocean some 60 miles from the launch pad. The fate of the seven-member crew, including teacher Krista McAuliffe, is unknown. But it's unlikely that any of those on board the shuttle Challenger could have survived. I'm Dick Reeves, CBS News. Now, direct from CBS News, this Radio Net Alert Bulletin. This is Mitchell Krause in New York. Stunned disbelief, tragedy, disaster. Cape Canaveral, the flight of the space shuttle Challenger. Moments after liftoff today, as you may have heard, it exploded in a giant fireball, apparently killing all the seven crew members aboard, 
Although there is no definite word on the fate of the crew, rescuers are at the scene. It was difficult to reach the scene, for debris fell for some 45 minutes after the explosion in space. Christopher Glenn is at the Cape. We'll be talking with him in moments on the status of the rescue effort now underway. Of course, the president and all members of the Congress and the Space Agency, the United States government, and I'm sure the people of the United States were shocked and saddened by this disaster at the Cape. The first time in flight in 56 United States manned space missions that there was a disaster and there was death. And ironically, just the other day was the 19th anniversary of the disaster on the ground that killed uh, several astronauts. But that was the first time we had a disaster and never in the air had a space shuttle encountered this difficulty. Krista McAuliffe was, of course, aboard that flight, the first citizen in space, the first teacher in space, and she was thrilled when she accepted her choice as the first private citizen to fly on the shuttle. This it's, from her White House speech. It's not often that a teacher is at a loss for words. I know my students wouldn't think so. I've made nine wonderful friends over the last two weeks. And when that shuttle goes, there might be one body. <laughs> but there's going to be 10 souls that I'm taking with me. Thank you. That's great. The parents of the New Hampshire teacher, of course, were on the scene at the Cape when the disaster occurred. They stared in utter disbelief as they watched the shuttle explode. There was cheering before the explosion. There was happiness, and then, oh, my God, oh, no, said one. And with looks of shock, the Corrigans, Edward and Grace Corrigan of Framingham, Massachusetts, the parents of Krista McAuliffe, were taken to another room by NASA officials. Christopher Glenn is at the Cape, and uh, Chris, uh, what's the latest that you have? In the last few minutes, uh, Mitchell, uh, very little from NASA itself. They uh, have put a few additional details on the story, but uh, uh, nothing major other than what, what, what is already speculated, which is that perhaps one of the two solid rocket boosters that help propel the uh, spacecraft toward its orbit and then are, are designed to fall away at a certain point in the launch sequence, um, separated from the uh, main rocket assembly prematurely and therefore caused the uh, rest of it to to go haywire and of course it's uncontrollable with that mighty thrust coming out of all those rocket engines and uh, it was very quickly over uh, still unknown is whether uh, the orbiter itself somehow uh, survived the explosion and somehow it would have to have been a miracle managed to uh, make a, uh, an aerodynamic glide back into the ocean and ditch there as as planes can do they can ditch in the ocean but this was from a tremendous height and it happened all at once without any advance warning and uh, it's not even clear whether um, the uh, ground teams or the computers on the ground were able to get the rest of the rockets separated from the orbiter itself so that it would be possible for commander uh, um, Francis Scobie to have, to have made a maneuver like that and tried to ditch at sea. At any rate, the, um, the rescue teams that are out in the impact area now, about 60 miles offshore, uh, we're seeing some NASA uh, cameras showing us pictures of the surface of the water, showing no visible chunks of, uh, of debris, but showing some chemical smears on the surface of the water, and uh, that's about all we know right at the moment. I do have with me once again Mitchell uh, James Rivers of um, WKXL in Concord, New Hampshire, and Jim, of course, has been on the phone uh, up there with them constantly since this tragedy occurred. And, uh, Jim, what can you add to the story from Concord now? Uh, actually, um, Chris, there, there are two points coming out of the city of Concord right now. Uh, high school principal Charles Foley closed off Concord High School to the media moments after it had happened. And his faculty and staff are meeting to offer uh, counseling to the student body or to any members of the faculty that feel that they need counseling to help them get through this day. Our reporters from uh, CBS affiliate WKXL and Concord on the street are finding that the people of Concord really don't want to talk about it. The, the, the mood on Main Street and in the stores where very little activity is going on right now, people are walking around with their, their heads bowed and really, as you might understand, not wanting to uh, talk to reporters and just sitting back and winning. I, uh, it, you told us earlier, didn't you, that um, the this was a day of great celebration at Concord High School, that the student body and the faculty had gathered in the auditorium in front of a large screen TV and were uh, celebrating the, the apparently successful launch in its first minute. Um, what happened when, uh, when they realized that something was going wrong up there? Dead silence uh, in talking with the members of the faculty at Concord uh, High School, uh, Harvey Smith, whose classroom is wired 
by NASA and was going to originate the question and answer series with Krista McAuliffe uh, on Friday now, uh, was in the auditorium and I have spoken with him and he said it was just all of a sudden as if you turned the, the volume switch on something off. It was silence altogether all at once. And then Mr. Foley uh, addressed the student body and uh, they filed out very quietly leaving behind all of their paraphernalia. Uh, Krista McAuliffe, of course, had planned to teach uh, two brief uh, lessons from space to a nationwide um, radio and television hookup to schools around the country, uh, which was to have been um, provided by the Public Broadcasting Service. The first of those was to have been uh, a sort of the grand tour of the, uh, of the space shuttle. The ultimate field trip was, I think, what she had entitled her lesson plan. And the second was uh, where we are, where we're going, why we're in space, that kind of thing. And she had said... Um, long before the flight that what she really wanted to do the real reason that she wanted to go into space was to demystify nasa and space flight uh, she wanted to show ordinary people and generations of young americans that there was a place for them in space and a reason that they should be going there and i think her her words are ironic and uh, especially tragic today uh, uh, given the scope of this disaster which we have seen before um again uh, jim uh, you you mentioned and i wonder if you could tell us uh, once more about the uh, plans for uh, special counseling for the kids at concord high uh, if any of them have uh, psychological difficulty with uh, with the tragedy well chris this is uh, as i indicated earlier there had been a tragedy at the high school earlier with a young student who had been involved in a, a shooting that many of the students witnessed and it required counseling and uh, charles foley the principal at concord high had gotten together his staff and many students did uh, go to the counseling now, on a much grander scale, with uh, most all of the student body in the auditorium viewing this, I guess there is going to be a need for some counseling. It will be offered uh, through the school. The school has been uh, dismissed as of 1 o'clock this afternoon for the student body to go home and, and be with their loved ones and be with their families. But once uh, the school bells ring again uh, in Concord, there are going to be uh, some students who will want to just talk it out. And the question again is, is why this all happened. Even Kristen herself said... I want to prove that it's a safe place to be, that it's just as, as safe as walking across the street. Let me interrupt you, uh, Chris, for a moment, and Jim Rivers. Uh, we have uh, Jake Garn, the senator from Utah, who flew in space and uh, was aboard one of the shuttles, and we'll go now to Washington for that. Well, it's very difficult for me to talk about it because these were my friends. Mike Smith, the uh, pilot, was my mother hen the first month that I trained. They assigned him to me go to my classes and help uh, brief me and I don't know of any time that I have been more shocked or more moved than when my first wife was killed in an automobile accident and so it's been uh, very very difficult for me this morning what does this do to the space program here and its support on the hill Senator? well I have great confidence in the space program I think it's a remarkable system and I think we should push ahead after we have determined the cause. Obviously, we should not fly until we have determined the cause of this particular failure. But I think we need to look at all of the successes, the remarkable safety record that the space program has had, the benefits that uh, come from it. And the crew members that I knew so well, I would expect that they would want us to go ahead with the space program after we have gone through the proper investigations and analysis and know what happened. How should we go about investigating this? Well, obviously, you have to gather all of the data. It has been impounded at this point. There will have to be a lot of studies, but there are some superbly qualified... Senator, you were on board the space shuttle. You felt that tremendous boost that you got. Now, from the telemetry that we heard, the voice data that we heard, they had just told the pilot to go to full throttle, and he had said he was throttling up. What happens at that moment? You have a combination of the solid rocket booster power and liquid hydrogen and oxygen in the main tank. And because most of your thrust comes from the solid rocket boosters, while you're still in the atmosphere, you can exceed the maximum dynamic pressure. So the main engines are only at about 60% of power until you get further out of the atmosphere. And they had just been given the command to throttle up. And then you go to 104% or maximum power on the solids or on the liquids. And so that is exactly what had taken place. They were high enough 
So they would not endanger the orbiter from too much pressure and were given that order that they could proceed to uh, what, increase the power. What are some of the things that can go wrong at that moment? Well, you have a very large external tank of very volatile liquid hydrogen and oxygen. And uh, you're just simply, it's like in uh, an automobile, you are putting more fuel. You're pushing down on the accelerator. You're putting more fuel to bring more uh, power. And, of course, at this point, we don't know whether it was one of the solids. We don't know whether it was the liquid engines or not. There's just uh, no way to know at this point. So, so what was your non-trained astronaut uh, missions that NASA had scheduled for this year? Do you think that they were capable of going ahead with 14 or 15 safely? Yes, I think so. The major problem uh, these last couple of missions has been uh, weather, and that is something that NASA cannot control. But uh, yes, I think the program was mature enough that, and with the opening of the second pad, Pad B, which Challenger was launched from this morning, with two pads I, and also the addition of the fourth orbiter, yes, I think they were capable of that schedule. Do you, Do you think, think it's going to make any difference to civilians in space from now on? Well, I can't judge what decisions NASA will make, but uh, my own opinion, again, after the investigations, we should proceed with the program, and that would include uh, the Civilians in Space program as well. As a civilian yourself going in, were you adequately warned that something like this could happen? Oh, of course. The, the training is very thorough and uh, very adequate. In my own case, having flown more than 10,000 hours, I was certainly aware that there are dangers in uh, flying. However, I still feel very strongly that uh, I'm much safer in flying an aircraft than any day that I'm on the uh, Capitol Beltway, and I don't mean that to be facetious at all. We kill nearly 50,000 people a year on the automobile in the highways of this country because of half of them because of drunk driving. I wish we'd pay a lot more attention uh, to that. Senator, should there have been some way for them, or was there any way for them to get out at this point? Should there have been? No, I don't think so. In uh, Columbia, originally, during the test phase, when just uh, they were sending two test pilots up, they did have an escape uh, capsule. The program had re uh, been proved safe enough, in my opinion, that they didn't need them in the other orbiters, and Columbia had been modified so that it did not have the escape mechanism in it. Uh, this is purely my opinion, but in watching what happened this morning, I would doubt very much, even if you had had an escape capsule on board or parachutes, that it would have been possible to get out with that kind of an explosion uh, in any event. Senator, in light of all of the delays surrounding recent shuttles and this one, do you think that NASA may have been too anxious to get this one off the ground? No. No, I was down on Saturday and for the launch on Sunday morning, and they were criticized on Sunday for being overly careful. Safety has always been uh, foremost in their minds. And we woke up on Sunday morning after having canceled at 10 o'clock the night before to a perfect morning. <clears throat> it was beautiful, sunny, clear blue skies, perfect launch, and there was a lot of talk that rather irritated me. Well, NASA was overly cautious. And so, no, I don't think that's true at all. What happens in your subcommittee now in terms of funding for the program? Well, I can't answer that question exactly because of Graham Rudman and the other budget constraints, but I certainly have no intentions other than to push on and uh, that does not change the uh, intent or the progress of the program. How do, how do you think the investigation ought to be handled, Senator? Should there be some sort of blue ribbon panel put together or should NASA be uh, allowed to handle it? Well, I think NASA has the technical experts, and if they need more than in-house, they will uh, pull them in. I don't think we need to uh, to go outside that other than to draw on consultants if, if necessary. NASA is so thorough and so careful. If any of you had experienced how they go through the redundancy and the backups and careful nature, the dedication of these scientists and engineers in NASA, I have full faith in them. They want the program to succeed. They want to take care of their uh, astronauts. It's always a real team effort. They work closely uh, together, and they will want to find out what happened more than anybody else. Senator, how lucky did you feel today that you returned safely? Well, I don't uh, feel particularly lucky. I, I think the program is, is reliable. In all uh, programs, in flight test programs for aircraft, we have, uh, we have accidents. And I, I don't uh, 
It's a surprise to me that it happened, but I, I would go again tomorrow. If, if NASA would let me go, I would go again. What effect is this likely to have on the community of astronauts? Well, first of all, they're all such a close-knit group. They're not looking any beyond today except the sorrow of losing some of their uh, their companions. You go through each one. I knew Krista McAuliffe uh, the least of them because she wasn't there. Greg Jarvis I trained with. Dick Scobie I knew. Mike Smith was my mother hen. And you go on a Zuka flu uh, in January last year when I was flying. So it's... Uh, and where they live together all the time, they train together, they fly together, there's obviously utter shock and disbelief down at Houston today among the astronaut corps. Live coverage of the aftermath of the tragedy at Cape Canaveral, the destruction in flight, the explosion that destroyed the Challenger and probably destroyed the crew of seven as well. We're bringing you live continuing coverage on the CBS radio network. Now we're going to the White House and Gary Schuster. Thank Yes, uh, the president has just spoken with some reporters here in the Roosevelt Room. He came in to uh, drop by a lunch that uh, was being attended by network correspondents uh, in preparation, getting some uh, background information on the president's State of the Union address tonight. The president was asked several questions, and uh, I'll give you just some of the responses he, he had. Um, he said, I don't think any of the astronauts who are in that program were anything other than volunteers. Is they volunteered for the program, they were aware of the risks, but he also pointed out, of course, that the program has had a 100% safety record up until now. He was also asked if, uh, if there might not be some public backlash because of this accident against the program, and he said, I don't think so. He said, I will do all I can to counter any such development. And uh, he also said that uh, before any other challengers or any other space programs uh, get off the ground that there will have to be a complete investigation of this and a resolution as to what happened before any of the others go up he said he still has confidence in the program and those who administer it and that is uh, nasa which is a civilian uh, operation the president also was asked about krista mcauliffe the teacher who was on board who the president greeted here in the rose garden uh, several months ago as uh, the teacher who was selected to go up in space and he said, I can't get out of my mind her husband, her children, and as well as the others who are on board, he said, but especially Krista McAuliffe. He was asked what reaction uh, he had to children because of Mrs. McAuliffe's uh, presence on this flight and the fact that she was supposed to do some teaching in outer space and, and programs had been done where children were doing uh, a number of projects related to this. The president was asked, what, what do you tell the children who see this, who will hear about it? And he said, I guess what you have to tell them is that life must go on. He was also told that, uh, of course, at his speech tonight, the State of the Union address is supposed to be upbeat, was supposed to be an uplifting speech, a vision for the nation for 1986, and doesn't this accident uh, cast a pall on it? And he said, I'm sure it does, but he said, you can't stop governing a nation because of a tragedy. Uh, basically, the president was uh, quite expansive on this, did a lot of talking about it, but again, his aides say that he knows not much more than what is going on and coming to him from the news media at this point. Uh, he has had no official reports. Uh, Gary, let me uh, break in here briefly. Yes. Uh, I suppose that uh, the initial reaction that people might have is one of surprise that the president would indeed go ahead with the State of the Union message tonight. You indicated that he said that uh, government uh, must go forward. Would there be any precedent in your, in your knowledge for him uh, postponing it or delaying it for another time? time well i i don't know the, if there would be precedent in it I, I i suspect that it would be although i can't go back in history that far to tell you if there has been a postponement of a, a state of the union address but uh the the, the mood here is now that uh, yes this is a tragedy and uh, and, and it would be looked at and then be investigated but at this point the staff including white house uh, spokesman larry speaks who told us earlier that the president will go on with his address will probably make some mention of the uh, of the accident uh, perhaps in in detail as much as he knows and perhaps bring the nation up to date on it but it might all almost be a forum for him to do that and, it, and, and, and for that reason alone he might give the state of the union okay gary shuster you might be interested in hearing that the soviet news agency tas has issued a one sentence report on the explosion uh, it was simply dateline new york and it said the u.s space shuttle challenger exploded shortly after takeoff uh, the soviet union is the only other nation that sent manned vehicles into space it reported the deaths of four Soviet cosmonauts in the past, uh, but so far, no further reaction from the Kremlin. And now, Christopher Glenn uh, in the case.
explosion that destroyed the space shuttle Challenger moments after liftoff. Chris? Yes, Mitchell. Uh, NASA's George Diller is back with us once again, and he has some um, new information about the kind of um, uh, rescue effort that's being mounted out there in the Atlantic, George. This uh, is, is a joint effort between uh, NASA and uh, the Department of Defense uh, uh, Management Office for Space Sh uh, Shuttle Support and also the Coast Guard. Uh, a number of uh, Coast Guard C-130s have flown from the Coast Guard Air Station at St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, another Coast Guard aircraft is coming up from Grand Bahama. Uh, they are now on the scene. One of the solid rocket booster retrieval ships that belongs to NASA was uh, uh, in that area at the time the Miss Africa occurred. That one is there. Uh, a Coast Guard hydrofoil is now there. Uh, we also uh, have a Coast Guard cutter coming up from Grand Bahama Island. So uh, at this point, we're, we're moving to the area, but so far not much has been found. I thought I saw on the uh, NASA cameras out there in the aircraft at the uh, impact site uh, some chemical residue on the water. Is, was that correct, or, or have they spotted anything at all yet? They have spotted debris. Uh, we're not, we, we don't know if it's solid rocket booster debris or, uh, or orbiter debris, and uh, we're still not giving up hope that the orbiter might be found uh, intact. You know, what condition the orbiter is in is going to depend on lo a lot of what the explosion was. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, could I break in and ask uh, a question from New York? Uh, for those who have seen the pictures uh, on television of the explosion, there appeared to be one large piece of something that went off uh, by itself. And I suppose some people might think, was that the uh, shuttle itself or was that a fuel uh, a booster? Uh, we haven't looked at that uh, tape closely enough to be able to tell whether or not it was the external tank or one of the solid rocket boosters. Uh, the one thing that we did see uh, appeared to be uh, a forward piece of a solid rocket booster that contains parachutes that was uh, uh, floating down toward the water. But uh, exactly what it was that had a trajectory off to the right of the spacecraft is not real clear if that was the tank or one of the solid rocket boosters. Now, George, um, we've been saying since the, uh, the very uh, beginning of our, our coverage of this tragedy that uh, there was an explosion of some kind up there. Um, the way I understand it, however, a solid rocket booster doesn't, it can't explode. It's a, it's a steady burn, sort of. And, and an explosion would seem to indicate that the external tank or the, some kind of a volatile liquid propellant was involved there. Not necessarily. Uh, in a solid rocket booster, when the composition of the solid propellant is poured, it must be poured in a very even fashion. And before uh, the segments are shipped to the Cape, the grain of the propellant is inspected to make sure that it is consistent. If it is not consistent, it will burn hot. It will develop hot spots while it burns. If you have a hot spot uh, that is significant, it can conceivably burn through the casing of the solid rocket booster and cause an explosion. So that will be looked at. Uh, we know this can happen because when we had a Delta flight uh, for the European Space Agency with the uh, 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 operational technology satellite that they were flying, uh, we had exactly that happen. There was a hot spot in the uh, in the uh, in the booster, it burned through the casing and caused the rest of the vehicle to explode. So we can't rule out that uh, that the solid is the culprit, but uh, we, we we don't know. We have we don't know how um, you know that the main engines may not also be involved. One more question from this end: uh, the uh, fact that this uh, vehicle was fueled up and uh, ready to go, and then had to be postponed. Is there any possibility or any view that uh, the kind of thing that goes into these delays could set up a situation that could uh, endanger the spacecraft? Well. Uh, I guess all our procedures will be looked at. I, I guess the unknown here, there are two unknowns uh, that normally would not be suspect in this case, and that is the fact that this is the first flight uh, from Pad B for the space shuttle. And uh, also, uh, this is the first time that we have attempted a launch in sub-freezing weather. Now, we have no indications that either is responsible. The ground support equipment, uh, you know, is not responsible for anything that happens in flight, but could it have contributed to a system malfunctioning in flight? So by impounding the data, which we have done, uh, it will be part of the evaluation as to whether or not any ground support equipment at Pad B might be suspect, whether or not uh, the cold weather procedures might be suspect, or a procedure 
uh, that we would normally use in any event might be suspect. That will all be looked at in addition to what we gather from the uh, from the flight systems data. Uh, one other question from here, and that is that given the pressure of public opinion and the coverage and the expectation, uh, if it had to be done all over again, is it possible that uh, without this heavy schedule that NASA might have delayed this uh, liftoff until they had even better conditions and more established uh, conditions to go with? Well, I, I think uh, we need to keep in mind that we've frequently been criticized for being too conservative, that we weren't moving out of our research and development posture fast enough. And I think this indicates that all of these uh, uh, procedures that we had that have been very slow and deliberate in trying to ensure against what might even be considered an inconse inconsequential risk uh, may have been necessary. And uh, all we can do is, is to watch to see what may, uh, uh, may be the result. It, it may not be something that we would have had any control over or something totally unforeseeable. Okay, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, we're coming back to New York now. Uh, we have uh, overseas reaction to today's tragedy, and uh, we'll be bringing you that shortly. Uh, as we mentioned, the Soviet news agency TASS, in a one-sentence report, simply indicated that it had received word from New York that the space shuttle Challenger exploded moments after liftoff. It appears, and uh, we've just heard from the Cape, that there are no survivors, although, of course, there is a rescue operation uh, going on uh, as extensively as possible under the circumstances to see if anyone conceivably could have survived that disaster. And now we're going to see whether we can get further uh, background information on uh, what may have caused today's uh, tragedy. Paul Kelter is a NASA aerospace engineer. He happened to be in Las Vegas today where he was talking uh, to people about the space shuttle program, and he was interviewed by CBS radio affiliate KNUU in Las Vegas, asked for his unofficial explanation. I have a pretty good idea based on seeing the launch go up what happened. Apparently, the external tank, which is uh, a very thin-skinned, 16-story high aluminum tank, which contains liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen fuel, uh, spontaneously exploded. And that's almost a million pounds of fuel. The solid rocket boosters, which contain solid fuel, apparently did not explode at that time. The orbiter, which contains the astronauts and experiments and so forth, uh, presumably exploded along with the, or as a result of the explosion of the external tank. Before the launch this morning, there were some reports that uh, ice and, and icicles were hanging from the, uh, the Challenger. Uh, what kind of impact uh, do you think that may have had? If there were icicles hanging from the shuttle, then, uh, or, or just layers of ice on the shuttle at some point, or any of the components of it, that could have changed the distribution of weight within the shuttle. But I don't know if that's actually, if there was actually any ice on board. Shifting the weight in the shuttle could, uh, I don't know if that could have caused such an accident. But certainly that uh, is a serious problem when ice is on board the shuttle. We, we can't launch the shuttle uh, really with a lot of ice or into a rainstorm. How will this tragedy affect the uh, space program? I would suspect that this tragedy would force manned mission, uh, the missions that we have with the shuttle, certainly to be put back by several months because now we need to investigate exactly why what happened happened. NASA aerospace engineer Paul Kelter. He was interviewed this morning in Las Vegas uh, by Luke Michaels of CBS radio affiliate KNUU. Now we're going to go overseas uh, to uh, get reaction from abroad to the tragedy at the Cape. Uh, Richard Roth is standing by in Rome, and uh, Richard, a city uh, that has uh, seen uh, such terrible tragedy in the recent airport massacre, uh, what's the impact there of this tragedy at the Cape? Mitchell, it was nightfall in Rome and across Europe when the explosion occurred. Radio and television here in Rome, uh, programs, normal programs were interrupted, and within an hour of the explosion, Italian television was broadcasting uh, pictures from the uh, uh, from the uh, scene of the launch site from Mission Control and from in the air where the where the ship exploded. All the adjectives were used that we've heard before. All of them inadequate, incredible, unbelievable, and tragic. The lieutenant, Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. Colonel Andrea Lorenzoni, who was one of three candidates for the Italian-American tethered satellite shuttle plan for 1988, 
was interviewed, he said that the explosion was incredible also from the technical point of view because he said that the security systems of NASA are so very high. He also said he was very sad from a human point of view because he had worked with Judith Resnick in Houston during his training there. Europe, uh, as you know, has a fascination with America, and a good part of that fascination is with American technology, a technology that many people in Europe have always said can accomplish the impossible. And tonight, I'm sure many here are wondering about that. Richard, thank you. Uh, we'll be talking with you uh, later on. I just wanted to ask you one more question before you get off the line. I did mention the airport massacre, and someone here remarked that how ironic life was that uh, so many people die in so many tragedies and aircraft accidents, and of course this happens at uh, Cape Canaveral, and the eyes of the world are focused on it in, in astounded shock and horror, and I'm sure that uh, perhaps from our side of the Atlantic we didn't uh, fully comprehend the shock and horror that all of you felt at the tragedy in Rome recently. All of these tragedies shock all of us. Richard Roth in Rome. Uh, Ronnie Hess is in Paris, uh, and I wonder if we can talk with her now. Ronnie, uh, uh, the reaction in the French capital. Well, I think that most people are stunned and shocked. There have been special reports on radio and television. There has been a great deal of reaction. The Minister of Research and Technology using the same kinds of words that perhaps are being heard in the United States. This is a black day for all of us, not just the Americans, but everyone. And uh, he has said, we think of all of our American friends and their families, not just the astronauts, but all of NASA's technical staff. He is sure that America will come back. He does not think this will hold back the U.S. space program. And frankly, he said it's a miracle that there have not been worse accidents considering the number of manned space flights. Ronnie Hess in Paris. The French uh, space program, of course, has uh, been in a European consortium, and I know that there have been some problems with some of the uh, delays that uh, they have had in, in the French program, but there is no manned French program as yet. Uh, uh, do, the, uh, do the French show a great deal of interest in the American space program? I think they show an extraordinary interest in the American program. Obviously, they have learned a great deal. Um, the competition that has often been spoken of on both sides of the Atlantic is certainly not in many people's minds tonight, although analysts say that it is possible that there will be a setback for the U.S. space program. It may have an effect on the schedule of satellite launches. However, as far as Hermès is concerned, there is the possibility that this accident will teach the French and the Europeans much in terms of making sure that safety measures are, all safety measures, or as many as possible, are taken into consideration when the French get further along and when the Europeans go further along in manned space flight. Thank you, Ronnie Hess. In, in Paris, we've heard from two European capitals now uh, the reaction to the disaster at Cape Canaveral today. In case you have just joined us, this is continuing CBS radio network coverage of the disaster that destroyed the space shuttle Challenger moments after liftoff today. And apparently all seven crew members, including the school teacher Krista McAuliffe and uh, the rest of that crew, uh, Francis Scobie, the commander, uh, Michael Smith, Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, Gregory Jarvis and uh, the uh, space teacher along with Judith Resnick all were aboard that craft and uh, the outlook uh, for the rescue is very bleak uh, for those who may have seen television pictures of the explosion uh, the possibilities of uh, picturing anyone escaping uh, from that holocaust uh, were extremely dim uh, David Martin is standing by at the Pentagon uh, he has an update on what's going on in the center of the defense establishment uh, the Pentagon being involved to some degree in the hopes and the future of the space program. David Martin. The recovery operation is being run by the Coast Guard, which had two uh, cutters in the area at the time. There were no U.S. Navy ships in the immediate area. You have the two Coast Guard cutters, a third cutter that is uh, close to the area, all three of them converging on the, uh, the site of where this uh, debris has rained down. There is a report, and we cannot confirm it uh, from here yet, that uh, the actual recovery operation was delayed somewhat uh, to stay out of the area while all this debris rained down. Uh, there are two Navy ships en route to the area. One's about 45 minutes away. The other is about two hours away. Uh, they, I don't think, will be any use in the immediate search for any possible survivors, but I think there will be a, a wide uh, search of the area trying to recover all possible debris in an attempt to figure out what happened here. 
course, we mentioned earlier the possible Pentagon involvement in the future of the space program. And, uh, David, how might that be affected by this tragedy? Although the, the Air Force was going to become one of the prime users of the space shuttle because they were going to use it originally as the sole means for putting all U.S. military satellites into space. But because of so many difficulties that had occurred on earlier flights, the, uh, the Air Force had insisted on retaining the capability to launch some high-priority satellites with its own rockets. Uh, now, of course, that we have lost, apparently, one entire shuttle, which, if you think about it for a moment, is the equivalent of the Air Force in, in one brief moment losing a quarter of all its airplanes. It's, it's a, a major catastrophe, just uh, not only in terms of the lives involved here, but in terms of the equipment. And now that that is lost, it is going to uh, throw this, this program of cooperation between the military and the civilian NASA agency into uh, great disarray, I would think. An interview with correspondent David Martin. We recorded that a few moments ago at the Pentagon. Uh, President Reagan uh, is at the White House. Uh, he had been preparing for the State of the Union address this evening, and uh, there was a considerable schedule for the day of preparation and exposure to the press, and he had been planning and indeed did meet with a group of network correspondents uh, to give them a preview of the address, which was to have been shorter and more visionary than previous addresses. This was his fifth. And at the meeting... At the meeting, the president told uh, uh, the reporters that it was a very traumatic experience this morning, but the program would go forward. And now, astronaut Glenn, John Glenn, the first man on the moon, but, uh, is in Washington at a news the conference. The people that were on the flight today carried our hopes and dreams along with them, and they'll live forever in our memories. And I guess that's the best tribute we can give to them. The... Uh, our prayers, our sympathy, our condolences go out to their families and friends. And uh, I guess that's about all we can say about them right at this time. It's been an amazing success story up to this very tragic accident today. I think this was about the 56th or 57th manned mission where we're dealing with new complexities and speeds and, and powers that man has never used before. And uh, we had hoped to push this day back forever, but that was not to be, and we all, I guess, intuitively knew that. So it's a day we don't want to repeat, that's for sure. Senator, what effect does this have on a space program or any sort of flight test program when something like this happens? This is Ohio Senator John Glenn, oh, the delays first man things, in space. Of course, because uh, there will be a very complete investigation. Our view of what happened uh, this morning would be only speculation at this point, although the very slow motion pictures I saw on one of the channels a little while ago uh, seem to show the first light coming out of uh, one of the solid rocket cases. Uh, whether that'll turn out to be the cause of the difficulty or not, I don't know. But I wouldn't think that this was, uh, you know, what it'll do to the program or how much it'll be set back will be dependent on the investigation. Was NASA trying to push too hard on this, Senator? No, I don't think so. If there's one thing NASA has not done all the way through, uh, it is uh, take a chance on cutting corners. Uh, and we've grown accustomed to success. And it's been an amazingly successful program so far. You know, I remember one of the TV commentators, I won't say which network, but one morning talking about when there was a delay commenting, when are we going to get this, this tur turn this turkey into an eagle? Well, we've become so accustomed to getting these things off on time that safety was obviously being, uh, at least in that commentator's mind, uh, was being given uh, short shrift. Why aren't we running these things like a regular airline schedule? Well, the fact that NASA has not done that. They run it with the idea of safety first and foremost, and that's been the way it's been operated ever since the days when I was in that program many years ago. And it's a tribute to them that they have not been goaded under pressure to taking any chances. And we'll just have to wait the, the accident analysis to see what happened in this case. Senator, were you watching the board? We're listening to Ohio Senator John Glenn, the first man in space in the Mercury and, uh, program. One of my uh, staff people... Uh, brought a note in to me about this, and then I left immediately and went up to my office. What was your reaction, particularly to the replays you've probably seen? Oh, my 
reaction was a profound sense of loss, I guess, that this day had finally come that we'd hoped would never arrive. In some ways, I guess it's... Uh, you know, in, in our human existence, I, let me be philosophical for a moment. I guess in our human existence there is triumph and there is tragedy. And uh, man tries many things. And uh, we advance as a whole human race because we, because we succeed most of the time. We make advances, whether it's in space or engineering or health or medical things. Sometimes, though, we aren't perfect. And then there's a tragedy that uh, brings us back to our own human frailties and our, our lack of perfection. And so that's the kind of a day we're faced with now. It's been an amazingly succe successful series of triumphs through the years. But it also is fraught with the possibility of tragedy, and that's what we came up against today. Ohio Senator John Glenn, who was the first man to fly in orbit around the Earth in the uh, Mercury program, he himself had a close call when a rocket package broke loose and uh, it appeared it might not work. Without it, he would have been trapped in orbit, but uh, of course he succeeded and came back to be the hero of space. Oregon Senator Bob Packwood today, when told the news, said every so often in the history of the world, great people give their lives to help the rest of us. That's what those in space shuttle have done today. We're all in their debt forever. Chris Glenn is at the Cape. There is a rescue operation still in progress. And Chris, is there anything new on that? Uh, not on the rescue operation itself. As a matter of fact, when we were speaking with um, George Diller a few minutes ago of NASA, um, he said it's, it's so agonizing waiting for reports to come back from that impact area and that they have uh, seen very little. They've seen some pieces of debris in the water, but they can't really tell what part of the uh, rocket assembly or the orbiter uh, that was. Now, there have been some slow motion um, reruns of the of the uh, camera view of the explosion, and uh, uh, apparently the, the huge uh, external fuel tank, the main source of propellant and thrust that pushes the shuttle into orbit and then falls away into the Atlantic and is spent, when it's spent, uh, that ruptured uh, nearly 50,000 gallons of volatile fuel board uh, and uh, it looked very much like it just tore Challenger into into very, very many pieces. Chris, can I break in for a moment? We've had word from Washington now that uh, President Reagan's State of the Union speech, which had been scheduled for tonight, has been canceled. The announcement was made by House Republican leader Robert Michael. A few moments ago, we uh, talked with Gary Schuster, who said the president had planned to go ahead with it. He felt the business of government would go forward, and of course he would uh, refer to it in his speech. But now apparently, upon consultation with members of the Congress, uh, who are very much involved in this event, the State of the Union a message for this evening has been canceled. Uh, House Speaker, House Republican Leader, rather, Robert Michael, made that announcement a few moments ago. President Reagan, a moment ago, was asked by a group of network correspondents uh, about the shuttle program. He told them, I'm sure there will be no more flights until the cause of the explosion is determined and any problems are solved. And, uh, Chris, let's go back and uh, uh, pick up where we left off uh, for a moment uh, before we uh, go to uh, Europe. We'll talk in a moment uh, with Dan Revive, who uh, is in uh, Bonn, talking to the European Space Agency, but I didn't want to cut you off. Uh, I know you had some more information. No, I understand, Mitchell, of course. Uh, but I was saying the, the slow-motion reruns of the uh, explosion of the shuttle Challenger uh, showed that the, uh, the the big external fuel tank did rupture, and, and when it did so, uh, it, it just tore the much smaller orbiter into a lot of pieces, and, and NASA has said uh, since that fine pieces of the debris continued to fall into the impact area out in the Atlantic for about 45 minutes uh, after it happened. Um, we uh, had mentioned that uh, George Diller of NASA was here, and he was describing to us um, after he left our air here a few minutes ago what, what happens now, and he said that um, they intend to treat it just like an, an airplane crash investigation. They will try to recover as much of the debris as they can, both from the surface and from the bottom of the sea. They will bring everything back here uh, to the Cape, or at least in the area. They will uh, have a special hangar, and they will lay all this debris out, 
and then from inspection of the debris and piecing together the telemetry and the other data that they gathered uh, uh, while the flight was in progress, they'll, they'll try to figure out just exactly what did happen. Uh, we have with us now a uh, longtime colleague, Spencer Allen, who is uh, uh, in the area locally and has covered uh, space uh, activities for CBS News for many, many years. And Spencer, you've been um, talking with a youngster from New Hampshire. Yes, uh, it was a Brian Ballard. He's a 16-year-old senior from Concord High School, and he's also editor of the uh, Crimson, the school uh, newspaper. He was still in shock when I talked to him. He had difficulty in expressing himself, but I asked him if he planned to file any stories for his newspaper today. What kind of stories have you filed today? Uh, well, actually, uh, I was planning on writing uh, a f uh, several big stories on the entire event. The paper is uh, only come, doesn't come out every day. It's only a um, quarterly paper. So I was planning on writing a final article, big article, and I wasn't really expecting this to happen. So I'm going to have to change my entire uh, scope, my entire view of things, as you know, what happened here. When's the last time you saw Christian McCullough? Last time I saw her was um, it's been a while. I saw her last October at a at a uh, teacher's conference. So I, it's been a while since I've seen her in person. Gentlemen, uh, this Mitchell across in New York, I'm sorry to break in again. I wanted to repeat for those who might be concerned about the uh, schedule for this evening that the White House has now canceled uh, President Reagan's State of the Union address, which had been scheduled for 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, there's no word on when it will be rescheduled. The announcement was made by the House of Representatives, by Robert Michael, the majority leader. Uh, another bit of information, uh, the irony of this day, uh, uh, Monday, just yesterday was the 19th anniversary of the death of the Air Force Lieutenant Virgil Grissom, uh, Edward Higgins White, and Roger Chaffee. Uh, they were on the Apollo 1 capsule when it exploded uh, uh, on the launch pad. Uh, we have uh, a man who has followed the space program with us over the years in Bonn, West Germany, and he is talking with European Space Agency officials in the West German capital, Dan Revive. I wonder, if, Dan, if you could tell us what reaction we've had over there. Well, Mitch, they're, they're a little bit hesitant to give the kind of reaction that, well, you'd fear to hear, to be quite frank. The European Space Agency, with its control center at Darmstadt, West Germany, uses a rocket called the Ariane. It's a joint project of the Western European countries. And uh, they use it, uh, launching it from uh, South America, and it's been successful. It has launched uh, several satellites in space, and they've always underlined the fact that it is unmanned and therefore safe safer than the shuttle, as well as being more efficient in the past. That's a point they're not pushing tonight. The officials we were able to reach uh, did not want to make any lengthy comments besides describing their shock and, of course, condolences. Put you and Dan Rabib on hold. We're going to Washington for White House spokesman Larry Speaks. L. The president, in consultation with the leadership of Congress, has decided to postpone the State of the Union address that was scheduled for this evening. He will address the Congress and the American people on next Tuesday. The President, in addition, has asked the Vice President to go immediately to Cape Canaveral's Kennedy Space Center, along with the acting NASA Director, Bill Graham. The Vice President will carry with him the President's personal concern for those courageous Americans who were aboard the space shuttle. In addition, the President will speak to the American people from the Oval Office later this evening regarding this tragedy. The President, since learning of the tragedy shortly before noon, has conferred with Don Regan, who in turn consulted with Speaker Tip O'Neill and Senate Majority Leader Bob Dole. They concurred in the President's decision to delay his State of the Union. A few moments ago, the President met in the Oval Office with NASA Director Graham and instructed him to fly to the Cape with the Vice President uh, to begin an effort to find out the cause of this tragedy. And then, the President said, to go forward with the nation's space program. The President said, and I quote, these people were dedicated to the exploration of space. We could do no more to honor them, these courageous Americans, 
than to go forward with the program. Can you tell us some of the reasoning in the decision to postpone, since, as you know, the president's first reaction was to go ahead with tonight's speech? This is White House spokesman Thank Larry Speaks. Like all Americans has seen this tragedy unfold on television and has felt keenly uh, what those family members must have felt watching that shuttle go into the air at, uh, at the Cape, first Pride and then second Hara. Um, the president feels that these same emotions are being experienced by people all over this nation at this moment. Uh, and with the con consultation of Congress that's taken place in the last hour or so, the president thought it was entirely appropriate that uh, his State of the Union uh, be deferred um, until uh, uh, and let him address the American people on what's happening here tonight. Did Senator Graham tell him finally what happened? Does he have information, confirmation? No, the, um, the uh, NASA has issued a statement indicating simply that there was an explosion aboard the space shuttle shortly after it lifted off uh, from the Cape this morning and that a search and rescue mission is underway. Uh, that is continuing at this hour and will, un will continue uh, until uh, all efforts to uh, uh, to find out uh, what the situation in there are exhausted. Does the president believe... Right. Oh, right. Well, Larry, is the president also going to cancel his State of the Union activities for the balance of the weekend? What time is the uh, of the march? The, uh, the president will... Um, this uh, will, for the balance of the week, continue on his uh, previously announced schedule with the exception of those activities which were designed as a follow-up to the State of the Union. They will be rescheduled for next week. The time of the address uh, to the nation has not been determined, uh, pending definite word from NASA about the situation. HHS, Treasury, and... White House spokesman Larry Speaks announcing to the nation and to the Washington White House press corps that the State of the Union message by President Reagan originally scheduled for tonight at 9 has now been canceled. It's been postponed until next Tuesday night. However, Mr. Reagan will address the nation from the Oval Office. The time of that statement has not yet been determined, according to Mr. Speaks. Earlier, the president said he would go ahead with that speech. All of this, uh, the result of the tragedy today at Cape Canaveral. The space shuttle Challenger exploding into a gigantic fireball moments after it had lifted off from the uh, launch pad, apparently killing all seven of the crew members aboard, including uh, uh, two women, Judith Resnick, and the first teacher in space, Krista McAuliffe. This has been CBS News special coverage of this tragedy. We'll continue throughout the day with more information from Christopher Glenn at Cape Canaveral and our CBS News correspondents around the world, bringing you the latest in reaction and the recovery effort. I'm Mitchell Krauss, CBS News, New York.
CBS News, I'm Douglas Edwards. The space shuttle Challenger had been in the air just over a minute when Mission Control reported a scene which eyewitnesses won't soon forget. Reports from the flight dynamics officer indicate that the vehicle uh, apparently exploded and that uh, impact uh, in the water. The Challenger is believed to have fallen into the Atlantic Ocean some 60 miles from Cape Canaveral. The fate of the seven-member crew, including New Hampshire schoolteacher Krista McAuliffe, is unknown. Among those eyewitnesses watching the ill-fated liftoff was Wendy Dickman. About a minute into the launch, I saw flames and um, spiraling smoke coming down, like fingers coming out of the sky, and we knew something was wrong. Ran in, put the radio on, and Mission Control had said that they had blown up. They weren't sure what had happened or anything. They would lost control and everything. Everybody was just stunned, totally stunned. NASA spokesman George Diller says the firing room at the Kennedy Space Center has been sealed. No one is being permitted to leave until everyone can be questioned. It will take weeks to go over all the data and voice recordings to determine just what happened to the shuttle Challenger. President Reagan has canceled tonight's scheduled State of the Union address. Because of the accident, he will make it one week from tonight, next Tuesday. The president was in a meeting with top aides when he learned of the disaster. Later, he said he couldn't rid himself of thoughts about the astronauts' families. He added, I can't help but think what they must be going through. He did say he wants a complete investigation before any more space launches, and he will address the nation later tonight about this tragedy at a time to be set when later word comes from NASA. It is still not exactly clear what happened. The initial stages of the flight appeared normal, both to the eye and according to telemetry data, it appeared one of the booster rockets may have separated prematurely. Another possibility is that one of the main engines exploded. A key unknown was whether the orbiter itself stayed in one piece after the explosion. If it did, that would have helped the astronauts' chances of survival, but that it, at this point, it's feared that all seven Americans were killed. Rescue efforts are underway. Correspondent Christopher Glenn is at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Chris, bring us up to date give us whatever you have at this moment well douglas the uh, rescue effort is still underway but um given the fact that there has been no new information from nasa on that rescue effort for about the past 45 minutes um, it's sort of like confirming some worst fears uh, at any rate there has been no word from them they cited a little bit of debris in the water but no major pieces of wreckage apparently there was some chemical residue and uh, they don't know where those pieces came from what we do know is that the explosion occurred as the challenger was uh, almost ten and a half miles up in the air it was traveling at that point at just about two thousand miles an hour the explosion occurred about eighteen miles from land but that uh, great forward uh, speed of the uh, rocket assembly at that point carried most of the debris almost 60 miles down range. It's deep water there, and of course it will be some time before they can get divers down and start making uh, inspections of the ocean floor itself. Here at the Cape, of course, um, uh, watching the flight, uh, many hundreds of students and educators from across the country and the uh, parents and uh, the immediate family of Krista McAuliffe, her attorney uh, husband Steve, and their two children, Scott and Nye, and Carolyn, six years old, uh, um, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, uh, Ed Corrigan of Framingham, Massachusetts, were McAuliffe's parents, and they were watching, and apparently, even though there was an announcement that the rocket had exploded, uh, they, they were just standing there. They apparently, they didn't realize what was going on until uh, a NASA, NASA official came up into the bleacher grandstands and, and told them, and uh, at which point they appeared stunned and were quickly led away. That's the latest we have from here. Now, it, it, it appeared that the main booster rocket exploded and uh, took the orbiter with it. Is, is that not your latest word? Yes. Uh, there's been some word recently about some uh, slow motion reviews of videotape of the explosion and um, they say that it appeared that the, the mighty uh, external fuel tank, which holds a half a million gallons of highly volatile fuel, uh, ruptured, this being after the initial explosion. And when it did so, uh, it said that it appeared that the the orbiter itself was just destroyed. It was broken into many pieces. Nothing yet from the rescue ships. Nothing yet, Douglas. 
In Concord, New Hampshire, students at Krista McAuliffe's high school sat in stunned silence as they watched the disaster unfold on television. They were sent home about an hour ago, many wiping tears as they left. In Washington, Senator Jake Garn, who rode a shuttle mission last April himself, was especially moved. Well, it's very difficult for me to talk about it because these were my friends. Mike Smith, the uh, pilot, was my mother hen the first month that I trained. They assigned him to me, go to my classes and help uh, brief me. And I don't know of any time that I have been more shocked or more moved than when my first wife was killed in an automobile accident. And so it's been uh, very, very difficult for me this morning. It's the first in-flight disaster in 56 manned American space missions. Three Apollo astronauts were killed in 1967. Now it's feared seven more astronauts may have been killed, but again, their fate at this time is unknown. Douglas Edwards, CBS News. News report on the tragedy today at Cape Canaveral, Florida. The explosion that destroyed the space shuttle Challenger moments after liftoff, apparently killing all seven crew members aboard, including schoolteacher Krista McAuliffe. The search is on in the Atlantic for the seven crew members or for debris or for any sign of what may have happened. So far, the only report we have had from Cape Canaveral is that streaks of chemical and some debris have been sighted. But the explosion was so severe, so catastrophic that it took some 45 minutes for all of the debris to stop falling from the sky and this of course delayed the dispatch of the manned rescue effort although navy vessels were in the area and helicopters were on the scene almost immediately it was at least 45 minutes before the final pieces of the huge spacecraft and the booster rockets had rained down from that gigantic explosion in the sky some two minutes after liftoff at the cape the reaction in the nation of course, has been one of traumatic shock. President Reagan has canceled his State of the Union message for this evening, postponing it for a week until next Tuesday, although Mr. Reagan will address the nation sometime tonight from the Oval Office. We do not have a confirmation of the time of that address as yet. The president also told a group of reporters at the White House shortly after the tragedy that the space program would have to stop its launch schedule of the shuttle until a complete investigation was made. We are, of course, awaiting any further information we might have on the fate of the crew, but uh, anyone who has seen uh, the pictures, uh, the televised pictures of what happened in the sky over Cape Canaveral would have to question very seriously whether there was any possibility of any survivors. And the only merciful thing that might be said uh, was that the speed and the catastrophic explosion made uh, uh, the end of the lives of those seven brave people instantaneous. One of the people, of course, aboard that had... Uh, galvanized the attention of the nation was the first citizen in space, a woman from New Hampshire, a housewife and mother, Krista McAuliffe. She had been chosen as the first teacher in the program, chosen from hundreds if not thousands of applicants for the honor of flying. And uh, just yesterday and the day before, through the delays, she displayed a remarkable optimism and uh, buoyancy about the prospects and said she wasn't nervous about the outcome. It was late July, shortly after she was chosen for the mission, that she spoke about why she thought she was picked as America's first private citizen in space. When I went down there, there were nine other excited, enthusiastic, good teachers who I felt could easily represent um, anybody on, on, as a group on the shuttle. And I'm delighted. I'm delighted I'm here, but I really don't know what gave me that extra edge. One thing that impressed the NASA people about Krista McAuliffe was her interest in diaries. She had planned to keep one on this flight. Well, I teach a course called The American Woman, and it's a social history, and I'm very concerned that the ordinary person has been left out of the history books. So I felt that this would kind of connect history with the, the shuttle, which is normally thought of kind of as a space science type or, or high-tech project. It is our history, and everybody should be able to connect with that space age. So I was going to write now in my journal while I'm on board the shuttle and then when I return and hopefully give the students a picture of what an ordinary person's perspective is like when they're up in space. Krista McAuliffe had special hopes for this morning. 
Well, just the thought that I'm going to be part of history, I think, is the most exciting. As a historian, that's a very important part of my life. To be able to see the Earth from the, the new perspective of the shuttle, I teach history, and we talk about international relations, and we try to look at international boundaries, but we try to kind of foster that world community. Everybody is dependent on everybody else, and, and looking at the Earth from the shuttle, I think that's going to be very evident. Krista McAuliffe in an interview conducted last July when she was chosen as the first private citizen in space. She, of course, was aboard the ill-fated Challenger this morning, along with six others. Uh, Francis Scobie, the commander, his second shuttle mission, 46 years old. Michael Smith, 40, of Beaufort, North Carolina. Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka of Hawaii. Gregory Jarvis and Judith Resnick, the other woman on the flight today. We have Tom Fenton standing by now in London. And Tom, uh, we know it's quite late at night there in, in the British capital. Uh, perhaps the reaction would be coming uh, uh, a little bit uh, beyond the end of the working day. But uh, what uh, have you heard in the British capital as a result of this disaster? Mitchell, uh, the British have been glued to television sets and radios all evening long. Uh, listening to uh, blow by blow accounts, watching what seems like an, an endless repetition on television of those pictures of the uh, shuttle exploding. Uh, the most characteristic comment I've heard from anyone w uh, watching these pictures is, it's incredible, it's unbelievable. The commentators on, uh, on television and radio have been expressing uh, shock and, and sadness. Uh, there are all sorts of speculation here as to uh, what exactly went wrong. One leading commentator said he thought it would be a brave astronaut who went up again in a, in a Challenger. Tom, uh, the British are not a direct participant in the American space program, uh, although they are part of the European space effort. Uh, how do the British react to these programs in, in America? And, and, you know, you're taking on a gigantic challenge in that country now if that uh, channel uh, tunnel is ever built and human lives will be lost there. There's, there's no lack of, of forward-looking daring uh, on uh, the other side of the Atlantic. Well, the British follow the uh, space program with immense interest, and I suspect a little envy, too. The British did quite a bit in the early days of space when it didn't cost much and dropped out of... Uh, of the space race a long time ago. They do, however, have, a, have an astronaut uh, who, is, uh, who is being prepared for a future program. And in fact, tomorrow, the, uh, the British astronaut and his backup were planning to give a press conference tomorrow morning. I don't know yet whether that press conference will now take place. Okay, Tom, well, thank you. We perhaps will be back uh, to you. Of course, we'd be anxious to hear any reaction that uh, the Prime Minister might have or anything from uh, Buckingham Palace. But uh, Tom Fenton in London, uh, the third of our European uh, reports, actually the fourth uh, since uh, this tragedy we've heard from Rome, uh, Paris, and Bonn. And now we're going back to the White House. Uh, White House spokesman Larry Speaks has just finished briefing reporters on the President's reaction and uh, his plan to cancel the State of the Union. And I wonder, Gary, if you could bring us up to date. Well, Mitchell, that's right. Uh, Larry Speaks did say that the president has decided to postpone his State of the Union address until next Tuesday. He has also asked Vice President Bush to go down to Cape Canaveral along with the uh, acting uh, NASA Administrator Bill Graham to carry the president's personal concern to the families and uh, the NASA people who were down there. The president also will speak to the American people tonight from the Oval Office about this uh, tragedy. We don't have a time yet on it, but uh, it will be sometime later this evening, uh, Speak said. The president uh, had said earlier that he was going to go ahead uh, only within the half hour before Mr. Speaks came out here and made the announcement. The president said he was going to go ahead with the address uh, tonight saying you can't stop governing because of a tragedy. But apparently, uh, uh, with uh, speaking with uh, the majority leader on the Hill, Robert Dole, in the Senate, and uh, House Speaker Thomas O'Neill, and I would imagine Mrs. Reagan had something to do with this because she apparently saw the liftoff on television and said, oh, my God, no, when she saw the explosion. I think all of those things perhaps changed the president's mind. Mr. Speaks said that the president initiated the, uh, the change in the address time, but uh, I'm sure there were other outside influences. Also, um, uh, the president also told uh, NASA Administrator Graham to find out the cause of the tragedy, but then to go forward with the space program. The president said uh, the dedication that these uh, these uh, astronauts had given to the program uh, 
force the United States to honor them in no, no other way than to have the space program go forward. And uh, Mr. Speaks also said that the president saw the, the explosion, the liftoff and the explosion uh, unfold on television and felt the pride and the horror that the, the, the nation did as a whole, he thought. And uh, it was because of those, those things that he saw, plus, as I say, the input from the others, that he decided to, uh, to cancel tonight's speech and put it off until next week. Gary, I noticed that the uh, Congress reacted immediately uh, when they heard the news. They observed a moment of silence in the House and then adjourned for two hours and uh, issued uh, several statements, and many of the members uh, said they were just appalled and, and uh, horror-stricken by what had happened. Uh, was there any indication of concern on the part of the White House as to the fate of the space program as a result of what happened today? Well, as I say, Mitchell, the uh, the president told uh, the NASA Administrator Grand to go down and find out what happened and then go forward with the program. Uh, that's sort of the indication that we've had here today all along that uh, that today's events will not deter the United States from pursuing its space program. And I and until until we see otherwise or hear otherwise, I think that's what we're going to have to go with. Okay, Gary Schuster, our White House correspondent. Uh, we'll uh, be waiting to hear from you, uh, Gary, as to the new time for the president's remarks tonight and how long uh, they are expected to last. Uh, I suspect this will not have any impact on the uh, progress of the legislative calendar, will it, the delay in the State of the Union? I doubt it, Mitchell. It's, uh, the budget is supposed to come out this weekend, and uh, Larry Speaks just told us that he thinks the, the budget will come out Wednesday, the State of the Union Tuesday, and uh, things should go forward. Um, what, what is interesting, of course, is the president was to send a legislative message to Congress tomorrow, really giving the specifics of, of his uh, legislative agenda, uh, because those were not going to be included in the State of the Union tonight. It was going to be a shorter speech. Uh, we'll see if that message goes forward as well. It, uh, it almost is putting the cart before the horse in that, in that, in that sense, because uh, then the speech would be following up with generalities about specifics that have already been delivered. But the White House uh, is now working on work on fixing up its uh, its uh, delivery of of the legislative agenda and the speech. So we'll uh, we'll know more later on. This uh, this whole thing, of course, as you can well understand, has uh, has struck confusion into into this operation. Gary Schuster at the White House. As you heard, uh, the president has now postponed his State of the Union message from tonight until next Tuesday, but will address the nation from the Oval Office sometime in the evening. Christopher Glenn is standing by at Cape Canaveral now, and of course down there the rescue effort is still underway, and the questions are coming in very rapidly. Chris? Some of those questions may be answered, Mitchell, uh, in about an hour and 15 minutes. NASA plans to uh, hold a news conference here at the Kennedy Space Center with Jess Moore, the Associate Administrator for Spaceflight, who has recently named the head of the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Uh, we don't know what they have to say at this point, but we'll certainly be following that. In the meantime, um, reporter Frank Motek of our Miami affiliate WINZ has been out and questioning some of the people who were here at the Cape as tourists to watch this launch. And uh, Frank, what did they have to say? Well, just as uh, you and I saw Chris, um, we were all shocked by it. Uh, they were shocked by it. And people uh, were gathered at the visitor center here at the Kennedy Space Center today to see the launch. They gathered from uh, all over the nation, and everyone um, was absolutely flabbergasted by what happened. Uh, the children especially expressed um, horror over what occurred, and uh, we spoke with uh, some of the people at that visitor center. Well, we just saw the um, space uh, ship go up, and um, you obviously knew something was wrong because it appeared as if it split apart in two pieces of fire separating and uh, going their own way. What was your reaction when you saw that? Um, my knees started knocking, and I just fell ill in the stomach. And where are you from? Boston. What is your name? Teresa Petro. Yeah. Yeah. What did you see from the highway? We saw the smoke going up with the fire right in front of it, it seemed. And then it broke off into two sections with a big ball of smoke in between. And then little trails of smoke like streamers going off to all different sides. Chris, I can assure you, uh, looking into the uh, people's eyes and uh, the children's eyes especially, all of them uh, hope to see uh, what was a historic occasion 
and later saw the uh, fireball and the trails that we saw here uh, at the uh, at the uh, at the CBS bureau, and just utter horror and uh, many of them wiping tears away. Okay, let us recap that um, at uh, 3.30 Eastern Time this afternoon, about an hour and ten minutes from now, NASA will hold a news conference here at the Cape with uh, a high official uh, presiding, and uh, perhaps we will get some uh, additional, more detailed information at that point. We do have the transcript of the last uh, communi voice communications with the spacecraft. It, it goes something like this. Mission Control says, Challenger, you are go at throttle up, and uh, Pilot Mike Smith said, Roger, go at throttle up, then the explosion, the Mission Control commentator apparently not knowing what uh, had happened went on with some uh, technical data about range and elevation etc then a long silence and then mission control simply comes back and say says um, flight controllers are looking very carefully at the situation the uh, tragedy at that point uh, already an accomplished fact Mitchell thank you uh, Christopher Glenn in uh, Cape uh, Canaveral Florida we'll be back with you of course uh, as the afternoon goes on and we will broadcast live the NASA news conference which is scheduled uh, in about an hour from now on the stations of the CBS radio network many of them will be carrying that live we hope then to obtain more information about the initial investigation that has been made of what may have caused the disaster today at the Cape which destroyed the Challenger just two minutes after launch and uh, resulted uh, we believe at this point, tragically, in the death of all seven of the crew members aboard. This is the first fatal accident in the manned space program in the air. There have been 56 manned space missions. This was the 56th, and this was the one that brought tragedy and disaster. We have Wyatt Andrews, our correspondent in the Soviet capital of Moscow, on the line. Uh, we know that TASS has made a short announcement about this, but Wyatt, uh, is there anything further, and uh, do you expect uh, that they will uh, go further with their description of what happened in Cape Canaveral. Mitchell, suspicions on that account are, are awfully tough to make. Uh, as, as you probably know, it is now 10.22 uh, at night in Moscow, and perhaps for that reason, as much as anything else, not for any lack of compassion, certainly uh, there has been no official uh, announcement from any Soviet officials, nor have there been any... Uh, reaction from any of the, the cosmonauts or even former cosmonauts, even though we are, are trying to reach them. Uh, again, it's just because that, that's because that is because everything is pretty much officially shut down and uh, the accident happened after hours uh, in Moscow. Having said that, as you pointed out, TASS did report, and with remarkable speed uh, and with great accuracy, uh, that the explosion had occurred. That TASS account coming about 30 minutes after the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger uh, and following that, about two hours later, uh, both pictures and that task report were part of the uh, Soviet nightly newscast. Uh, the only thing remarkable about that is that it came with remarkable speed. I should point out that, uh, in contrast, in past Soviet mishaps, uh, both in 1967 and in 1971, uh, reporting of those mishaps here, uh, you know, took a great deal of time. Uh, I, I certainly, in the in the in the aftermath of this, don't mean to imply any lack of compassion on the part of the Soviets. Uh, it, it probably reflects, uh, given the passage of time and given that this is the 1980s, uh, uh, a more instantaneous response on the part of Soviet newscasters. Uh, this is not the kind of uh, event, uh, especially given the fact that the Soviets have a sizable space program. Uh, where we suspect any ideological reaction whatsoever, uh, again pointing out that the TASS and nightly newscast reports in the Soviet Union have been uh, very straightforward and very accurate and have been reported without comment. Uh, White Andrews, we'll maybe back with you later on. If you have any further information, we'd uh, certainly want to hear from you. We have retired uh, General Chuck Yeager on the line with us now. Uh, Chuck Yeager uh, broke the sound barrier, and uh, all of you uh, may know of his career. He's talking with us uh, from his home in Grass Valley, California. And, Mr. Yeager, what is your reaction to what happened today? Well, my reaction is uh, the unfortunate accidents, but uh, it's not the end of the space program, obviously. Uh, it'll, t it'll be quite some time before <clears throat> NASA comes up with a, uh, a finding as to the cause of the accident. And uh, this, this is the way the system works in, in all accidents, whether it's a shuttle or a commercial airliner or a military airliner. They have to analyze all of the telemetry data and the information they have and find out the cause of the accident fix it and see that it doesn't happen again and then uh, press on. 
I wonder if uh, people uh, understand uh, the kind of danger, the kind of courage that is required uh, for people like you and the space uh, personnel, the astronauts, to get into a vehicle, uh, whether it be a, a wow. super speed plane. Yeah, he, professional flyers uh, or astronauts or the, or the like uh, that fool around with the uh, equipment such as this uh, obviously are quite dedicated and they're uh, it's their job and that's the way they look at it and that's the way i looked at it when i was flying research airplanes uh, that's the reason they pay you money it's uh, no different from doing it any other job at least I, that's the way i looked at it you know, I suppose most Americans remember the portrayal of your exploits in The Right Stuff in the motion picture and, and the great courage that it took uh, both on your part and uh, your compatriots who were flying in that other world of space. Uh, and I wonder if you had any final words about a moment like this, uh, which uh, appears as such a shock to all of us. Yes, as I just, just mentioned, uh, you look at it, just a second. Okay. Chuck Yeager at his home uh, in California. I'm sorry. That's okay. I can't, you're breaking up a little bit, and I didn't hear the whole question, but it, well, it's basically what I said earlier, that uh, number one, uh, guys like who fly uh, both the shuttle or airline airliners or military aircraft, they look look to it as their job. And there's a, that's, that's the only way I can explain it. Chuck Yeager, who... Uh, was the first man to break the sound barrier, uh, an experimental aircraft, and uh, is one of the great pioneers of American aviation, commenting on today's tragedy at Cape Canaveral, the destruction by an explosion of undetermined origin as yet of the Challenger just two minutes after liftoff, a shower of debris hurtled into the Atlantic. The Holocaust undoubtedly destroyed uh, all aboard that craft, although a rescue operation is still underway at uh, Cape Canaveral. We have been hearing from correspondents of CBS News around the world, uh, reporting on reactions, as you heard moments ago, from uh, Moscow, the Soviet news agency tasked with uh, remarkable speed and accuracy, reported what happened at the Cape. There was also shock expressed at the European Space Agency in West Germany and in Italy, uh, where the Italian space program has been a participant in the U.S. space effort, also in reports from Paris and from London. Of course... The tragedy is centered, too, on the people, certainly, who perished uh, in today's disaster, and the one who captured the imagination of the American public, uh, perhaps more than any other on this flight, was the first citizen in space, Krista McAuliffe, uh, who was chosen uh, from a large uh, group of competitors uh, last July to have that honor, and uh, throughout the days just prior to the flight, and even during the three postponements before today's uh, fatal and disastrous lift off had expressed great optimism, courage, enthusiasm, hope, uh, anticipation, and was to have taught uh, two lessons from space this week, lessons that were to have been televised, uh, a unique and uh, breakthrough kind of uh, venture. Uh, that, of course, uh, will never happen with this teacher. And the questions now arise, uh, questions being asked in Washington and at the Cape, as to the fate of the space program, though the president and everyone else says it will go forward. It has been under a very heavy schedule. Twelve more space uh, shuttle launches were due this year. Whether that schedule now has uh, proven to be too much in retrospect, uh, whether the delays or the pressures contributed in somewhat to this disaster today will, of course, be the focus of the investigation upcoming. President Reagan's State of the Union message delayed for one week from tonight. However, he will speak to the nation in a while, and we will have the live coverage of NASA's news conference later. Mitchell Krause, CBS News. WCBS News time is 29 minutes after 2 o'clock. Well, as you have been hearing for the last uh, couple of hours, it was just past 11.30, a minute and 12 seconds into the space shuttle Challenger flight when the spacecraft exploded. It appeared no one could have survived. On board, of course, school teacher Krista McAuliffe, the first private citizen to fly in space. And coming up, you'll be hearing from people on the streets of New York who just couldn't believe it. Fred Fishkin will have that story. We'll also have reports regarding this mission from uh, Walt Wheeler and from Ellen Mitchell. Another local story today, Queensboro President Donald Manis is stepping aside temporarily. He signed a document which has designated his deputy as the acting borough president. He has also resigned as the Queen's Democratic Party leader. 
Wall Street is up about seven and a half points, although, as you might imagine, the aerospace stocks are down. Our weather story, 23 degrees, humidity is 41%, clear, diminishing winds, still very cold, lows in the mid-teens in the cities, zero to ten above in most of the suburbs. Tomorrow, sunshine giving way to increasing cloudiness, chance of a period of light snow late in the day or tomorrow night, highs in the mid-twenties. On Thursday, clearing and cold, highs 25 to 30 degrees, 23 right now at 2.30. I'm Ben Farnsworth. Space Shuttle Challenger exploded into a gigantic fireball 75 seconds after liftoff today, apparently killing all seven crew members, including school teacher Krista McAuliffe. Fragments of the $1.2 billion spacecraft, one of four in NASA's shuttle fleet, fell into the Atlantic Ocean 18 miles southeast of the Kennedy Space Center launch pad. There was no announcement of the fate of the crew, but it appears there was no way they could have survived. The explosion occurred as Challenger was 10.35 miles high, speeding toward orbit at almost 1,200 miles an hour. The shocking spectacle was witnessed by family and friends of the astronauts who gathered at Cape Canaveral, and by millions more around the country who viewed the launch on television. President Reagan postponed his State of the Union speech, which had been scheduled for tonight. Mr. Reagan told reporters at the White House, it's a horrible thing all of us have witnessed. He said, I can't rid the self, myself of the thought of the sacrifice of the families who were there at the Cape watching this tragedy also. He said, I can't help but think what they must be going through. The NASA administrator, William Graham, was meeting with congressmen on Capitol Hill about the NASA budget when they saw the disaster on television. Other crew members, Commander Francis Scobie, 46, the 40-year-old pilot, Michael Smith, 36-year-old Judith Resnick, 35-year-old Ronald McNair, Ellison Onizuka, 39, and 41-year-old Gregory Jarvis. It was the first in-flight disaster in 56 U.S. manned space missions. The explosion a devastating setback for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration after successfully carrying out 24 shuttle missions. John Glenn, the former astronaut and the first American in orbit, said we have become accustomed to success it has been an amazing success story so far. On the slow motion video rerun of the explosion, it was difficult to determine the source of the explosion, but unmistakably, when a huge fuel tank with nearly a half a million gallons of a volatile propellant ruptured, it tore the Challenger into many pieces. After the explosion, the two solid fuel booster rockets separated and continued to fly crazily out of control in a clear sky, trailing long tails of smoke before they plummeted into the seas, one of them seen floating down on its parachute. Television pictures of the impact area relayed from a helicopter showed no evidence of any large pieces floating in the water. NASA said the explosion occurred at a point when astronauts were beginning to throttle their engines up to maximum thrust after they throttled them down to 60% level at 35 seconds in order to reduce the forces of gravity during the liftoff. Among those who witnessed the explosion, Mrs. Uh, McCullough's attorney husband, uh, Steve, and their two children, nine-year-old Scott, six-year-old Caroline. They were in the crowd watching at Cape Canaveral. Also there, members of Scott's third grade class from Concord, New Hampshire, displaying a large Go Krista banner. They watched in stunned silence as the spacecraft blew apart. Several began crying. Parents hugged others and quickly they cleared them off the viewing bleachers, bleachers and herded them to the buses. Also there, Mrs. McAuliffe's parents, Ed and Grace Corrigan of Framingham, Massachusetts. They stood silently during the launch, arm in arm, remained standing together as the loudspeaker brought the bad news and a NASA official climbed a couple of rows into the bleachers, walked to them and said, the vehicle has exploded. A stunned Mrs. Corrigan looked back at him, repeated his words, a vehicle has exploded. He nodded silently and the Corrigans were quickly led away. The spouses of other astronauts were also there. No immediate reaction from any of them. All 1,200 students at McAuliffe's Concord High School were cheering the televised launch when a teacher yelled for them to be silent because something appeared to be wrong. As it became clear there was an explosion, stunned students murmured, it can't be real, we can't be watching this. First Lady Nancy Reagan, watching the launch alone in family quarters, explained, exclaimed, oh my God, no. The House of Representatives interrupted its session, and the chaplain delivered a prayer for the astronauts. The House then adjourned. The gleaming ship had risen spectacularly off the launch pad at 11.38. Here in the city, New Yorkers were also stunned by this tragedy in space, and Fred Fishkin has a report. It's the kind of tragedy that became instantly etched on the faces of people as soon as they learned the news 
On 45th Street in Manhattan, groups of people were huddled around the television sets in a Crazy Eddie's store watching in disbelief. I saw it happen. I was casually looking over, and all of a sudden I saw this explosion. And it's unbelievable. And what I know, I don't think anybody got out alive. Um, it's really, a, I never thought it could happen. Rich Blauman of Long Island, who stood shoulder to shoulder with Jose Rodriguez of Staten Island. I feel real bad about it. Like, I thought of this was this kind of thing would never happen. 25 shuttle missions and, uh, and with this one, so many delays and postponements. And, and then for it to have ended like this. Many found it hard to put their feelings into words, but then again, they really didn't have to. Fred Fishkin, WCBS News. Morning today on the part of a Long Island teacher who was in the competition to take part in the ill-fated Challenger flight. Nellen Mitchell has that story. Susan Agruza was a physics teacher in East Islip. Beyond that, she was a finalist in the nationwide competition to select a teacher to go into space. Agruzzo says when they all first applied, no one really even considered the dangers of a space mission. No, we were never concerned about that. The safety record of the entire space program is outstanding. And it is just very, very unfortunate that this should happen. Um, I feel very, very sorry for Christmas family and for her children. I, it's so incomprehensible to me that they were watching this morning and should see such a thing happen. What words would she convey to them? There are none, said Agruzzo tearfully. I'm Ellen Mitchell for WCBS News. Senator Jake Garn, the Utah Republican, the first senator to fly on the shuttle, gathering his thoughts, and uh, so was Congressman Bill Nelson, the last member of Congress to fly aboard the shuttle. We'll hear more from Walt Wheeler coming up in just a little bit. The President's State of the Union speech scheduled for tonight has been canceled. And the President will speak to the nation tonight, but exactly when that speech will take place, we do not know. Well, well, some of the reactions, uh, Larry speaks in talking about the decision to postpone the State of the Union and characterizing the emotions of those who'd watched the launch and explosion in a phrase that may go into history, first pride, then horror. The reactions as characterized by Larry Speaks at the White House. NASA Communications' first word of the explosion, obviously we have a major problem. Senator John Glenn, the first American to fly in orbit, said, I guess we always knew there would be a day like this. A day like what? Well, CBS correspondent Bruce Hall at the Cape tells us that some observers, apparently not NASA personnel, who have viewed slow motion videotapes of the disaster, said that the explosion aboard the Challenger appeared to begin in an area of the spacecraft assembly where the main liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen fuel tank is connected to the solid fuel boosters, are connected to one or the other of the two of those. Others, however, says Hall, think that the explosion began in one of the solid fuel tanks itself. According to Hall, those observers drew their conclusions from viewing slow motion videotape. CBS News correspondent Dan Rather adds the idea that the area of the liquid fuel tank described by some of Hall's observers is the area of a seam which exists across the liquid fuel tank. The solid fuel rocket boosters are seamless stainless steel, but there are seams in the liquid fuel tank. Also to note, the solid fuel is relatively stable. In fact, NASA says it's very resistant to explosive combustion. The solid fuel boosters are supposed to be propelled away from the main body of the launch vehicle after they're separated, which should have occurred a few moments after this explosion, by what NASA's documents call small rocket separation motors. And that's after the firing of some explosive bolts, which are triggered by an electrical charge. The solid fuel itself, a mixture of aluminum powder, aluminum perchlorate powder, which provides the oxygen, and a little bit of rust, not uh, accidental rust, deliberately introduced to control the speed of burning. It has roughly the consistency of the rubber in a typewriter eraser. NASA has to use a small rocket motor to set that afire as the launch sequence begins. It is not stuff that is easy to make blow up. It's said to be insensitive to static, friction, or impact. Going back, though, to people who have looked at the slow motions, Senator Glenn said it appeared to him that one of the two solid boosters on either side of the main engine had a blowout at the case of the cockpit or the crew area of the shuttle. Stressing repeatedly, though, that he was only speculating, Glenn said the first point of light from the explosion that he could see in reviewing the slow motion videotapes appeared to be coming out of the solid on the booster. That sequence on the slow motion is somewhat hazy because of the distance uh, some 19 miles away from the cameras so it is very difficult whether it ruptured or not says Glenn he really doesn't know 
The boosters were developed by Norden Systems. That's a firm based in Norwalk, Connecticut, a subsidiary of United Technologies, which has its headquarters in Hartford. Both of those have been flown repeatedly and without incident. And in fact, after this explosion, they continued to fly or at least catapult through the air, perhaps out of control. One of them was uh, seen deploying the parachute that's normally used to uh, bring it back down so that it can be recovered. This disaster, and it is apparently that, although NASA still says that they are not going to make any statement on the fate of the crew until after the all search and after all of the search and rescue efforts are exhausted, uh, is the first in flight in the U.S. space mission in 56 of them in all. Three astronauts were killed, of course, back in 1967, 19 years and a day ago, in a launch pad explosion during the Apollo program. They were Virgil Gus Grissom, Roger Chafee, and Edward White. 19 years ago yesterday, the 27th of January, 1967. Grissom, Chafee, and White had been rehearsing for a launch of their Apollo spacecraft when a fire broke out in the spacecraft while they were still on the launch pad. All three were asphyxiated in the five minutes that it took rescuers to open the hatch from the outside. That launch pad, by the way, no longer in use. It's dedicated instead to serve as a monument to participants in the space program. Today's launch was the first from the new pad, which is supposed to be able to speed up the launchings of shuttle missions. The president, of course, has said that there will be no further manned space launches until this one is entirely sorted out. Other fatalities in the space era have all involved Soviets. Soviet cosmonaut Vladimir Komanov was killed in the same year as uh, Grissom, Chafee, and White, March 23rd. That was a re-entry crash. And cosmonauts uh, Georgi Dobrovolsky, Vladislav Volkov and Viktor Patsayev died from repressures, uh, depressurization. Uh, their Soyuz 11 capsule, when it was re-entering back in 1971, that June accident ended a then record-length space mission that had been hooked up with their space station for some 23 days before making the re-entry and died at that point during the re-entry. Up until this point, NASA had conducted 24 space shuttle missions in slightly less than five years without anything resembling a serious incident. The first space shuttle flight ended successfully on the 4th of July, 1982. That was an eight-day flight. Going back in space history, the first manned U.S. mission was May 5th, 1961. Alan Shepard and the Mercury spacecraft, which he called Freedom 7, a 15-minute suborbital flight. And then John Glenn's mission, February 20th, 1962. Friendship 7, he flew three orbits in a little under five hours before going on to the other space exploits for which he uh, became famous. Neil Armstrong, the first moon landing, that a successful mission uh, despite some of the difficulties that occurred on that. In uh, 1969, this tragedy, uh, a number of people saying that it set us far, far back in our space mission, clearly that remains to be seen because uh, the NASA investigation is just obviously barely beginning. One of the key points, though, is going to be at what point that explosion appears on the slow motion. NASA has techniques for enhancing that video. There are others who have those techniques that will allow an even closer, closer study of what exactly happened. But as of this point, it appears that all seven of the uh, crew members aboard this Challenger mission are apparently lost. NASA, however, declining to confirm that, saying that they will withhold any announcement on that fact until all search and rescue efforts are out. The President's State of the Union postponed until next Tuesday. He will, however, at some point this evening, address the nation on the subject of this catastrophe. About every place in the world, as people not only see some of the taped replays of what happened, but as word spreads everywhere. On Wall Street, uh, some of the aerospace stocks were also hurt. Morton Theocall, uh, they stopped trading on the stock. It's the stock that makes the propellant that is used in the space shuttle. And when it opened, it was down about three points. Some other stocks were down more than a point in the aerospace industry. WCBS News time is 2.44. It's 23 degrees. The humidity is 41%. The wind is out of the west at 15, gusting to 22. And it'll be clear tonight. Diminishing winds still very cold. <laughs> Stories making headlines at a minute to three. A terrible, terrible tragedy for the American space program. Shortly after it took off from Cape Canaveral, the shuttle Challenger exploded in flames, fell into the Atlantic. Rescue crews are at the scene. There are believed to be no survivors. The crew of seven included the school teacher, Krista McAuliffe. President Reagan has postponed until next Tuesday evening his State of the Union address. He will address the nation tonight about the shuttle disaster, and WCBS will be broadcasting that speech. 
The president has directed Vice President Bush to fly to Cape Canaveral to head an investigation of the explosion. Among those who were shocked, the New Hampshire school students who Krista McAuliffe taught. Some were at the Kennedy Space Centers. Others watched from the school in Concord. I'm Ben Farnsworth. CBS News covers the world at 3. CBS News, I'm Dick Reeves. Ships and helicopters are still searching for debris from the shuttle Challenger, which blew up soon after launch at Cape Canaveral. Apparently all seven people on board, including teacher Krista McAuliffe, were killed. As a result of the tragedy, President Reagan has canceled the State of the Union message, which had been scheduled tonight. We have two reports. First, Christopher Glenn at the Cape. The shock has not yet left the senses of anyone here who saw a shuttle Challenger explode in the air little more than a minute into its flight, and as yet little is known officially. The questions, though, are legion. Are the seven crew members dead? What caused the explosion? Did the numerous delays in the launch or the freezing weather in Florida have anything to do with it? And what happens to future launches? This was to have been NASA's most ambitious shuttle year. Perhaps some will be answered about a half hour from now when NASA officials here at the Cape will hold a news conference. In the meantime, there is there has been no word from the rescue teams out in the Atlantic that any debris has been recovered and not the slightest sign that anyone survived. All the flight data has been impounded for study and the plan is to bring as much as possible back to the Cape to try to piece the details of the greatest tragedy in space, space flight history together. I'm Christopher Glenn, CBS News at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This is Gary Schuster at the White House. White House spokesman Larry Speaks said President Reagan felt that because of today's tragedy, it was appropriate that he postpone his State of the Union address until next Tuesday. Instead, Mr. Reagan will speak to the American people about the explosion of the Challenger. I think the President, like all Americans, has seen this tragedy unfold on television and has felt keenly uh, what those family members must have felt watching that shuttle go into the air. At, uh, at the Cape, first pride, and then second horror. The president has asked Vice President George Bush to fly to Cape Canaveral Space Center to meet with the families of the astronauts. Mr. Reagan also indicated he wants the space program to continue. Speak said Mr. Reagan feels that the nation could offer no greater tribute to the dedication of the Challenger astronauts than to keep the program going once the cause of today's tragedy is resolved. Gary Schuster, CBS News, the White House. And that's a news conference scheduled a half hour from now. will be broadcast over many of these stations. More after this. In Concord, New Hampshire, where Krista McAuliffe taught, cheered when the shuttle lifted off, then sat in stunned silence as the disaster unfolded on TV screens in front of them. Reporters were ordered out of the school. The students were sent back to their classrooms and later were sent home. Principal Charles Foley said there was not much left for them to do. Pray. I don't know. We'll pull it together. We've done it before. Uh, it's not going to be easy, and that's for sure. Uh, we'll we'll talk like we did before, and we'll discuss. And, and we, uh, my my staff, my terrific staff, will come together. Washington, like the rest of the nation in the world, was shocked by the tragedy. Oregon Senator Bob Packwood said, Every so often in the history of the world, great people give their lives to help the rest of us. That's what those in the space shuttle have done. We are all in their debt forever. Now this. Wall Street at this hour, the Dow Jones Industrial Average is up 11.36. Recapping the shuttle story, the search continues in the Atlantic off Cape Canaveral for debris from the shuttle Challenger, which blew up late this morning, soon after launch, apparently killing all seven people on board. President Reagan has canceled his State of the Union message tonight. Instead, we'll speak to the American people about today's tragedy. I'm Dick Reeves, CBS News. And of course, we'll continue to follow that story throughout the day for you here at News Radio 88. We'll also be telling you more about the fate of Donald Manis. Uh, he has decided to step aside, at least temporarily. Students in the classroom. I, I did do a broadcast of the uh, of the CBS News uh, or, or whatever to um, uh, to the school. Everyone listen. It certainly had a sombering effect on the entire student body because everybody knows that the two of our kids are down there watching it. Jennifer Knapp and John Bonish, both 11th graders. Um, Subsequent to that, I uh, heard from the superintendent's office that, uh, <clears throat> and from one of the staff members who was with uh, the two uh, the two students from McMahon at Cape Canaveral, and said the kids are obviously devastated, but all right. 
Dr. Porcelina says the satin group left Florida immediately for the return trip back to Connecticut. Fran Schneido for WCBS News. Soviet embassy expressed a deep condolences and sympathy for the deaths of the seven astronauts killed. They called it an enormous tragic explosion of the space shuttle Challenger. According to spokesman Boris Malakov, two hours after the spaceship exploded, he said on behalf of the embassy, I express deep condolences and sympathy to the American people in connection with this enormous tragic accident involving the shuttle Challenger. Malakoff said the statement was intended for the American people and family members particularly. Also, uh, some of the people, some of reaction from people, Senator Jake Garn, who flew aboard the space shuttle Discovery nine months ago, was moved to tears today at the news of the explosion of the shuttle Challenger. The Utah Republican described the seven astronauts as his friends and said, I don't know any time that I've been so shocked and so moved since my first wife was killed in a car accident. With his discovery, crew insignia pinned to his lapel, Garn said while he was aware of the inherent danger of the shuttle launch, he and the crew of his flight never discussed it. He said, you just always assume that everything would go right. He added, I would go again. Garn referred to Mike Smith, the pilot of the down shuttle, as my mother hen. He watched my first launch and said, all of the others were people I knew, particularly Mike, I learned to love. Garn, who chairs the subcommittee that funds NASA, said today's disaster should not deter the space program, including the civilian in space program, in which Krista McAuliffe, the first teacher in space, was the initial participant. Garn expressed the utmost confidence in NASA and its training program and its ability to determine the cause of the accident before continuing the space program. More now about some of the people who were on this flight. The naval aviator Michael Smith, one of the most experienced pilots in the astronaut corps, logged more than 4,300 hours in 28 types of aircraft. He was the co-pilot of the Challenger flight that ended in flames. It was Smith's first shuttle flight. He was born in uh, Buford, North Carolina in 1945, earned a Bachelor of Science degree from the Naval Academy in 67, and a Master's degree in Aeronautical Engineering from the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School in 68. He was married and the father of three children. He held the Navy Distinguished Flying Cross, three air medals, and the Vietnamese Cross of Gallantry with Silver Star. He completed jet training in 1969 and was assigned to Advanced Jet Training Command, where he served as an instructor from 69 to 71. In 1974, he worked on the cruise missile guidance system at the Strike Aircraft Text uh, Directorate, and that's in uh, Patuxent River, Maryland. Before joining NASA as an astronaut in 1980, he completed two tours of duty in the Mediterranean Sea aboard the carrier USS Saratoga.